Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. Tonight is Monday, March 7th, 2022. Thank you all for joining us, both in person and online. We will start our meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thanks for joining us this evening. We've got a, uh, a relatively short agenda compared to some of our agendas recently, so looking forward to that. Uh, good to see we've got four of our council members here this evening, and I know that we've got uh, at least two more online, and I think we're going to be missing one this evening. But um, Mr. Brillard, if you could please call the roll of the council. Councilmember Coulter. Present. D'Alessandro. Present. Lohman. Here. Martin? Present. Nelson? Here. Mayor Bussey? Present. And Councilmember Carter is absent. So we have six of the seven members of the Bloomington City Council in attendance this evening. And as uh, Mr. Billard said, uh, Councilmember Carter is abs absent this evening. Item three on our agenda is approval of tonight's agenda. And as I said, it's a uh, relatively shorter agenda than we've had in, in recent uh, weeks. We have uh, an introductory, a couple of introductory items. We have the work plan for our Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission. We'll be hearing from them in a review, I think, of 2021 as well. Got a proclamation this evening. Uh, our consent to bu business. Under our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, what we have is a, a public comment opportunity. I, as we talked about last week, we are in the midst of redistricting uh, and moving boundaries around as it relates to the 2020 census results that have come through. So we're going to be having a presentation from our city clerk about the the, the council districts that have been moved and the city precinct, precincts that have moved, and we'll have the opportunity to allow for some public comment on that. Uh, we are uh, it, 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 we won't be going for approval. We're just looking for a comment on this this evening. This is a, a fairly compact process that we have to have done by the end of this month. So this is an opportunity just to get some feedback on the redistricted council member districts in the city precincts. And uh, then under organizational business, we're going to talk about our 2023 budget process with uh, Kari Carlson is here this evening to talk about that. We'll talk about the Bloomington sales tax uh, update and we'll go through that process as well. Council, anything in addition or any changes or additions to this evening's agenda? Hearing none, I would move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second by Council Member Martin to accept tonight's agenda. Hearing no further council comment, Mr. Brillard. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 6-0, and we have an agenda for this evening. Item 4 on our agenda is our public comment period. It's a 20-minute period at the start of each council meeting where we allow residents to come forward and speak to the council for up to five minutes on items not on tonight's agenda. Uh, we start our public comment period with item 4.1, which is a response to the previous meeting's public comments. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Good evening. Uh, no response to previous comment. Nothing on 4.1. Any questions, Council? With that, we will move to item 4.2, which is the public comment period. As I said, 20 minutes uh, for the public comment period. We'll, we limit speakers to five minutes total, so it's fair for everyone. And as I said, uh, item's not on tonight's agenda. It's not uh, set up as a back and forth, but rather they're an opportunity for the council to hear from uh, residents on, on issues. And if there is anything that needs to be responded to, we will do it at the, uh, the next meeting where we would have the other uh, response to the previous meeting's public comments, which would be item 4.1. So I know we had two folks who called ahead, and why don't we start with them? Uh, they wanted to provide some input via by phone. Um, I believe we have Sally Ness and uh, Mr. Rick Zeidler on the phone. Jerome, good evening. Jerome, Hello, good evening, Matt. We have only Sally Ness on the line. Thank you very much. And Sally, your line is open. Ms. Ness, are you with us? Yes, hello. Good evening, welcome. Okay. Thank you. I previously pointed out, a council member stated, we take confirmed violations of permitted use seriously. I am sure that any potential issues will be addressed promptly if brought to the department's attention. 
The following indicates differently. March 2019, the Star Tribune reported Darrell Farouk will host a public solidarity event. The event was held in the gym that is limited to 500 people by a condition that goes with the land that Darrell Farouk, mayor, council, and police chief knew about. This event was attended by Attorney General Ellison and Representative Omar, among others that draw large attendance numbers. This is not the first time Darrell Farouk had too many in the gymnasium. A letter to Darrell Farouk, July 2014 states, your success at 8201 Park has resulted in more frequent, larger events. Most attendees seem to be driving to the events, causing both 8201 Park and the city's parking lots to fill and in turn causing parking to spill onto the surrounding streets. In addition to the July 5th, 6th event, one held on May 31st resulted in a similar large parking overspill on two streets. Yet, and yet, once again, Darrell Farouk had more than 500, causing parking to spill onto the surrounding streets, and the city not only watched but participated. A council member who knows the gym is limited to 500 sent out media that states amazing turnout, stop by if you can. Pictures from the event include parking on Columbus, Park Avenue, and Oakland from 81st almost to 86th Street, and on 81st, 82nd, 83rd, there were 380 vehicles counted in the street. That included parking too close to fire hydrants, too close to and blocking driveways, too close to other vehicles parked where it is posted no parking, and parked too far out into the street and into an intersection. Again, the council member states any potential issues will be addressed promptly if brought to the department's attention. They were not. On March 15, 2019, the day before the event, the city received an email from Darrell Farouk about the event. The morning of the event, the police chief sent a message from his iPhone that he would contact the mayor to see if he was interested in joining him at the event. Shortly after, the police chief sent a message from his iPhone. The city manager indicates that he saw the event on Facebook and questioned whether the event was covered from a traffic management perspective. It was not. Neither address the limit of 500. On the day of the event, the police chief at 208 creates a report that states problem change from other to community engagement by Bloomington police. The police chief knows the building is limited to 500 and does not address it or concerns with traffic management. Another report is created at 227 PM and states parking was a concern, but in light of the world events, minor parking issues were advised upon. Only intersection and driveways blocked would be enforced today. None seen, no action taken. Pictures taken right before the report include parking too close to a fire hydrant and of a vehicle too far out into the intersection. There was a call to the police at 3.11 p.m. reporting cars in no parking zones, cars in front of fire hydrants, and blocking people's driveways, and yet the officer reported, reported previously none seen. The pictures of traffic issues that day are not minor as the report states. An email the day after the event indicates a recap would be a phone call and not a written report. This needed a written report and one that accurately reflected the number of people who attended the event, the traffic generated and the traffic issues. The point, the council member who wrote potential issues will be addressed promptly if brought to the department's attention and at 8201 Park, they are not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ness. Jerome, is uh, Mr. Rick Zeidler on the phone? Yes, I am. Oh, good evening, Mr. Zeidler. Welcome. Thanks for uh, taking my call. Um, I'm not reading a script, uh, as many are, uh, who are maybe in person or on the phone. I'm just uh, actually doing this uh, from my heart. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Rick Zeidler, as you said, sir, and, and my wife, uh, uh, Carol and I live uh, in Bloomington, and, and I have lived in Bloomington since uh, ninth grade. That would be 1957, so I'm a Bloomington High graduate. In fact, uh, when I graduated from high school, Bloomington was still a, a village uh, politically and uh, became a city <clears throat> later in the fall of 1960. Uh, but I also uh, taught in Bloomington for over 30 years, which I'm very uh, pleased about. Um, I was very proud to be a Bloomington teacher, and I also got to work uh, for... 50 summers in a row for the Bloomington Parks Department, and uh, very pleased about that. Most of my years uh, being in water safety at uh, Bush Lake Beach. 
But uh, just wanted to call, sir, thank you and all the council members for their stellar work. Um, we are grateful for all the amenities we have in our city uh, with clean streets, uh, sidewalks, uh, the way the city takes care of uh, uh, the streets and so on, and the parks and recreation department. We're grateful for the police department, the fire department, and uh, I just thought it'd be nice to have a call come in once in a while that was, uh, and I know people have their First Amendment rights, certainly, uh, and can complain about whatever they want to, but I think it's just nice once in a while to have a, a call that comes in that uh, is grateful for all of the fine work that the the councils have done over the years, and there have been many of them, of course, uh, and uh, I've known some, and, and uh, I, I heard uh, a Nordstrom lady on not too many weeks ago, Karen, I think was her name, I remember her uh, well, she was a council member many years ago. But anyway, I thank you for, for listening, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Bussey, Mayor Bussey, and all the council members, uh, some of whom I know have a hard time getting back to me with messages because they're so darn busy, and they all have uh, jobs besides uh, working for the council, I'm sure. So, uh, But anyway, uh, it's, it, it's a pleasure to uh, call in and, and uh, uh, give a compliment where compliments are due, and I'm so grateful uh, for the city and all of the fine amenities that we have in the, in the city uh, here of Bloomington. I'm so proud to have been a resident of the city for most of my years since ninth grade, since 1957. So I appreciate uh, your, your time, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, the city council members. I'm grateful to all of them. Well, thank you, Mr. Zeidler. Thank you for the kind words. Appreciate it. I see two council members with hands up, um, and I'm guessing one of them is a well, council member been a little too busy to get back to you. Council member uh, Lohman and then council member Nelson. Council member Lohman? Yeah, is that, uh, uh, Mr. Zeidler, you know, I owe you a phone call, and uh, don't worry, it's coming soon here. I have been busy. Uh, you know that, but uh, I do, uh, I really appreciate uh, you uh, sharing those words with us uh, this evening, and uh, I'll be getting back to you soon. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, and, and first, I appreciate the comments of the, the last um, individual, uh, Mr. Zeidler. Thank you very much for that. Um, my I raised my hand with regards to Ms. Ness, and I would just like to get more information in regards to the situation in which she was talking about, um, you know, because there's been a number of um, unfortunate incidents at that uh, address uh, and where people have attacked that address. And if we're going to fault them for having too many people after someone attacked them, I, I, I think that's um, uh, unfortunate and inappropriate, but I don't know the specific dates and things of that nature. So if I could just get a little bit more information on that, that, that would be great. It's I just want to have the whole story, not just uh, cherry-picked data that um, someone comes to, uh, you know, with a vendetta and, and an ax to grind. Uh, I, I like the whole whole story uh, before I make up my mind on anything. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. Mr. Verbrugge, I'm assuming uh, next week, or actually two weeks out, we don't have a meeting next week, but two weeks out we could have a bit more context and a discussion or a little better explanation as to the dates that we've been, we'll, been referencing We'll earlier. provide that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to add clarity to that, I am the council member that Ms. Ness is quoting in saying that I believe that our city would respond promptly to any issues, and I was not on council in 2019, so I don't think that those two incidents are actually related to each other, so I just want to clarify that, too. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Jerome, are there any other callers who wish to speak to NM 4.2 this evening? Jerome? No more lines who wants to speak. You may continue. Thank you very much. We've got no more callers, so we'll turn to the uh, folks here in the uh, council chambers. Anyone like to speak at the two, uh, public comment period? I'm for item 4.2 this evening. Okay. Can I get the overhead, please? Grant, could we get the overhead, please? Thank you. Yeah. 
Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I just want to take you guys back to July of um, uh, 21 last year. I spoke um, on shopping carts actually at the City Council meeting. So back in July of 21, I had a, a Human Rights Commissioner, Anita Smith, and I uh, put my name out and uh, basically on some Antifa pages. And I want you to note that there is no disclaimers. Um, she was in the chambers speaking uh, regarding <clears throat> me or my public comment, you know, during the council meeting. So if you look at the council rules, um, one of them says that you have to have advocate positions on the city. Now, mine wasn't a position of the city. It was a position of me, so I can see how she wasn't really in violation of that rule. But uh, was Anita's position approved by the city council, um, or was her seating in the chamber approved by the city council? Um, and then also there was no disclaimer um, on the tweet. So if you go back to the tweet right here, there is no city disclaimer, you know, on that. So she's actually speaking um, and taking the city position. So look at the rules there. It looks like a rule violation to me. Um, so as you guys know, I did speak about carts in the city. And I've talked to a few business owners in the city that are kind of, uh, <clears throat> they're getting more and more carts. So this, this business owner didn't talk to, but this is Hunt Electric right here. This is right across from Walmart over here. And you can see a lot of these carts actually have been sitting here for about half the winter. Um, sitting on their sides, you know, in the snowbanks. So I got to believe this is giving the plow people some problems too with the sidewalks because some of them are covering up the sidewalks. This is over on Chicago Avenue and American Boulevard, right across from Walmart. Um, Mr. Verbrugge, I know you did talk about this, um, about the wheels not working. They apparently still are not working. So Walmart looks to be a vape major uh, violator of, of carts, you know, basically all over the city. So then you go over to, um, this is right off of Portland and uh, American Boulevard. Here you have two more carts, you know, right near the bus stops, right? Um, so, and then I kind of cruised right down American Boulevard and then you get over to Culver's right off of Nicollet Avenue and, uh, and American Boulevard, right? And I live about two blocks from American Boulevard. So this is like up and down that corridor, right? Now, Mr. Coltier, you and I had a conversation, right, via email about this. Um, this appears to be a Met Council issue, maybe not a city issue, but I'd like to see some action, um, not this kind of action, you know. But Mr. Rubrugi actually did state he was gonna, gonna do some kind of cart corral or something like that. And uh, in the next public comment, I would like to know if you guys are working on some type of uh, action regarding carts all over the city. Like I said, it's getting to be, you, you guys, I know you can put together an ordinance of some sort, maybe a nuisance cart ordinance or something to that effect. I mean, that, I think that'd look great. But anybody coming into the city, even for a visit, you know, to see carts up and down American Boulevard. And like I said, it looks to be like, and I understand the homeless are, are, are pushing these carts along American Boulevard. And they're putting those carts near the bus stops. It really looks like it's an issue near the bus stops particularly. So I look at it as a Met Council issue too. Um, and I don't know, I got to believe other cities have got some ordinances in place regarding this, but I hope that the Met, maybe the Met Council can get a cart patrol going, you know, so we don't have to absorb it as a city, as a city issue. So, but again, in the next public comment, Mr. Verbrugge, if you could uh, uh, let us know what you're doing to, uh, to work on this issue. So, and it does appear there's a lot of blue carts, right? I'm going to say it right out front. That's a lot of Walmart carts all over the place. And um, on Facebook uh, the other day, I saw a Walmart that was out of carts where the customers were coming in. And there was no carts there for the customers to grab. And I kind of thought, was that a Bloomington Walmart? Because they're all over the city, right? So it was kind of a, I was joking around on, online there. But you guys know that it's an issue. So I'd appreciate you guys just addressing it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thule. Anyone else wish to speak? Well, good evening, Mayor and City Council members, I'm Dory Mazur. I've been a resident here for 25 years. Good evening, I, welcome. Can you hear me? Why don't you move the, if you could move the mic a little closer to you, it might be helpful. Yeah. My, my husband drug me here 25 years ago from the city of Minneapolis, and I have enjoyed my living here. I would like to talk about COVID tonight. I know it's an old, old story, but I think things are changing and I would like to help. I would like to have us change them. I would love to be the first city in Minnesota that can, that can claim freedom from COVID. I think that would be absolutely wonderful. What I've done here is put together 
Some references that I will be quoting, we don't need to go over that, but I'd like to start here at statistics. How many of you know what VARES is? Oh, good, good, so I don't have to go over that. The US death data is from VARES, the same with the adverse reaction data. And I'm sorry I put the European in, that's, in a, that's nothing for us. Okay, the 2,000% increase in fetal deaths that's a lot. And what I've heard from a doctor was that a woman gave birth to a baby, two days later it was dead. And that was from pulmonary blood clots. And I don't see a, an infant developing those in two days. The pulmonary um, oh, embolism, okay, some of these notes are for me to remember to talk to you about them. But that kind of a, goes in with the heart attacks. Uh, I talk, uh, Jane Ruby was talking to an undertaker. He was trying to embalm his customer and he couldn't. The veins were blocked. He took the veins apart and in them he found white worm-like objects that went from the groin all the way down to his ankle. And they were blocking the, the blood flow. If this type of stuff continues, I shouldn't say continues, but this is something of a real concern because the blood can't get to the heart. The heart stops and it's instantaneously. People walking down the street are gonna drop dead. People driving their cars are gonna just drop dead. Same way with airplane pilots. So far, there's been four of them that have dropped dead on, in the air. And you people have had three Employees here who have also dropped dead in this manner. Um, so going on to other information. The life insurance companies have reported a 40% increase in the deaths of people from 16 to 64. This is our workforce, so we're losing them. Normally, a 10% increase in deaths in that age group would be a 200-year event, and we're at 40%. So something's happening here. Back to the individual, mRNA has been found to go through your body in six hours and start messing with your DNA. What this could mean is we don't know what's in the mRNA shot, we don't know what they have put in. Maybe it was monkey RNA. We are no longer human after we have the shot. We're transgender. Uh, spike protein goes to every org or organ in the body. And Fauci keeps talking about building herd immunity. How can we build herd immunity when he keeps us at home he keeps us masked. He keeps us away from everybody. You build herd immunity by going and very slowly introducing yourself to a virus. I would like us to start moving towards becoming a good city to live in. And with the masks and no No effort to prepare us or help us along to becoming. I was in, bah. It's been a long time since I've done the speaking. Uh, to help us get our way towards humanity. Hum okay, what's the word? Ms. Major, your five minutes are up. Be that way. Thank you. And, and I, I will say, Ms. Major, I, I mean, there's a number Major. of things that Major. Are, are not. Major. Major, excuse me. Major. Major. Major, excuse Thank me. Thank you. A uh, number of things are not verifiable one way or another. Yep. And uh, they, they don't necessarily respond or relate necessarily to the city. You but didn't our, our, our three city employees who have passed away over the past 18 months or so, unless you have direct and verifiable, credible, credible evidence, 
I don't want to be disrespecting our former employees in that way and their families. I can so, check that out. One of them was a friend of my husband's who used to work for the city. I'm, they were friend, They had a lot of friends. They had a lot of friends in this building. And I, would, I don't want to disrespect their lives. I don't want to disrespect their families by inferring one way or another about the cause of their death. So, I, okay. so thank you for your information. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to the council this evening? I see no one coming forward. Council, I will close tonight's public comment period, and we will move on to item five, our introductory items. And item 5.1 is our 2022 work plan for our Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission. I've said a couple of times over the past few weeks, our city charter requires our boards and commissions to provide a, uh, a recap of the previous year and a work plan for the council to approve for the coming year. And uh, we are now with our Park Art and Recreation Commission and very happy to have tonight our Park and Rec Director, uh, Ann Catry, and um, Mr. Andy Hoffman, who is the Vice Chair of our Park, Parks, Arts and Recreation Commission with us tonight. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor, members of the council. It's very nice to be here in front of you this evening. Do we have Laura Peralt? Laura, our chair, is uh, joining oh, very us good. virtually this evening. So I'd like to introduce Andy Thank and you. Laura virtually, and I'll pass it over to Andy. Um, Laura is actually going to kick off the oh, very good. slides. So. Very good. Chair Peralt, I apologize for, for omitting you <laughs> in the introduction. Chair Peralta, are you there? Mayor looks like she might be on mute. Let's see what I can do. There we go. Chair Peralta? Can you hear me? Yes, are you guys able to hear me? We can indeed hear you. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bussey, Council members. Thank you so much um, for having us here this evening to present the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission 2022 work plan. Um, I'm Laura Peralt, the chair of the commission, and as you can see, Andy Hoffman, the vice chair, is joining in chambers. So we are going to be looking ahead to 2022, but before we do that, oh, go ahead to the next slide, please. I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, just back one. Thank you. There we go. Perfect. So tonight we're going to be looking ahead to 2022, but we want to take some time to recap the 2021 park key accomplishments. So our first uh, key accomplishment we wanted to highlight was the Award of Excellence. So the Bloomington Parks, Arts and Recreation Award of Excellence is bestowed annually by the commission in recognition and grateful appreciation of community service and dedication towards the advancement of parks, arts, and recreation programs and facilities in the city of Bloomington. For 2021, Reggie Bellinger was the recipient of this award of excellence for his steadfast dedication to improving and expanding the reach of pickleball in Bloomington. The 2022 Award of Excellence nomination period will open in June of this year. This will be your opportunity to nominate and recognize anyone you believe to be deserving of the award. And it should be noted that you can nominate more than one individual for this award. Secondly, we completed the cultural arts support grant review um, process. As you know, the city of Bloomington offers cultural arts support grants to fund general operating expenses for Bloomington centric nonprofit organizations and arts related educational institutions. The purpose of these grants is to provide a general operating support for high quality established cultural arts groups and organizations that produce, present, or exhibit works of art, groups and organizations that provide a broad range of services to artists and art appreciators, as well as organizations that make enriching, engaging, educational, and entertaining cultural arts opportunities available to people of all ages abilities and interests within the community. 
In 2021, $178,000 worth of grants were given to seven different Bloomington arts organizations. Thirdly, we completed the park system master plan and it was adopted by council. As you know that this was a very long two year planning process to lay the foundation for the parks department, as well as park improvements over the next 10 to 20 years. This project took significant community um, engagement and was led by the park and supported by council every step along the way. So thank you for your support. And finally, we completed our annual review of fees and capital improvement plan. All right, so shifting into 2022, this is the annual park work plan projects that we complete every year. So looking ahead to this year, we're hoping to continue and resume our Bloomington Park and facility tours. We will continue to work on the cultural arts support grant funding review and make recommendations. We will also continue our budget fees and capital improvement plan re review and our park planning and park projects will resume throughout the rest of the year. So now I'll hand it off to Andy to share our 2022 commission um, initiatives. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, so council, we've got three initiatives that we're gonna cover this year. Um, the first is park service area planning. The second is park maintenance and operations planning. And the third is natural resources planning. Uh, so park service area planning, this was something that was recommended uh, in the park system master plan. Currently staff is finalizing an RFP uh, for the creation of uh, several elements, Bloomington service area concept plans, schematic plans for two parks, and a standardized park shelter building design. Uh, the process will involve extensive community engagement and create a vision for nine parks across the city. So in, included in the park service area planning, there are six elements. Uh, the first is a vision for parks and facilities uh, as outlined in the Park System Master Plan. Uh, as you remember, and as Laura mentioned, uh, that was approved last year, and uh, really the culmination of two years of effort. Number two is conceptual design plans and estimates for each of the nine neighborhood parks. Uh, those parks include, this one I definitely have to read, uh, Sunrise, Southwood, Brookside, Poplar Bridge, Smith, Running, Gene Kelly, Bryant, and Trepba. Uh, the third is guidance on construction phasing for each one of the parks. Uh, as you can imagine, you can't just let the lowest bidder run with it as they see fit. Number four uh, is schematic design. That's about one third of the way through the design, about 30% of the way through design. Um, for Bryant Park and Trent Baugh Park, uh, as case study elements, uh, case study examples of what park renovations could be as envisioned through the park system master plan. Uh, these two parks are expected to begin construction in 23 or in 2024. Um, so you'll definitely be hearing plenty more about those in the not too distant future. Uh, number five is park shoulder building schematic design. So again, about a third of the way through design. Uh, and the goal of that is to serve as a general design standard for park buildings uh, across the park system going forward, uh, but specifically at eight potential sites, uh, Sunrise, Southwood, Brookside, Poplar Bridge, Smith, Running, Gene Kelly and Bryant. And the sixth element of this plan is that the Park Commission will assist with community engagement. So it's safe to say that you and the community and everybody who's listening and watching right now uh, will be a part of the process going forward and, and there's plenty more work to be done. Uh, the next initiative uh, is going to be recommending a park system and operations, parks, park maintenance and operations plan. Uh, the plan's currently in progress uh, and it'll recommend levels of maintenance and needed resources for maintaining parks. Um, the process will set consistent standards of maintenance and is intended to improve the overall operations, safety, and user experience at each of our parks. And the last but not least initiative, uh, one that's been discussed in the past, is natural resources planning. Um, this was also a recommendation of the Park System Master Plan, uh, and it's currently underway. The goal is to prioritize natural resource projects in the city and guide the work of the staff over the course of the next five to 10 years, um, and also help with budget and asset allocation and applications for grants uh, for the recommended priority projects. The next slide, those are our initiatives for this year. Um, and as you can imagine, as happens most years, there's, there's some change um, in the overall uh, Parks Commission. So first and foremost, Stephanie Tungseth, who you've probably seen before, past chair, um, she's had three years of service and she is, is stepping down um, as our chair and as a Parks Commission member. She was a 
phenomenal asset. I mean, she was the chair when I came on to the Parks Commission, along with several of the other people that are on our commission right now. Um, great resource, excellent in mentoring, and really showing us the ropes and, and getting us up to speed. So we wish Stephanie the best, uh, continued success, and although she won't be on the commission, we will definitely be seeing Stephanie around. So looking forward to that. Um, and as you know, Laura, uh, who gave the first three slides, uh, Laura has stepped up to become the next chair. She's got five years on the commission. She is the most veteran person on the commission. She is the best suited for that position. So we're really looking forward to, to working with her. Um, I've been on the on the commission for, this is my second year now. I get to take uh, Lauren's, <laughs> Laura's spot as the vice chair. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And we've got two other members that are still on the commission that are part of what I call the class of 2021. Uh, people that joined at the same time as me. Phenomenal people, uh, Joy Fogg and Lance Schuer, uh, both dedicated to the parks uh, and, and just great to work with. Um, Scarlett Rundle is our youth representative right now, youth commissioner. Uh, she began last August. She'll continue through to next August. That's the cycle is one year for the youth members because they tend to disappear for college and whatnot, I assume. Um, but then two additions that we're really excited to have. Um, these are people that I have not met yet, but that will change on Wednesday when we have our park commission meeting. The background, everything I've learned about these people is phenomenal. I mean, so good job in, in the appointments this year. Really excited. Uh, Chris Fleck and Daryl uh, Eager uh, will be joining us uh, starting on Wednesday. So we're excited to, to see what they have to offer and, and get to know them. With that, uh, the requested action uh, is a motion to adopt the 2022 Park Arts and Recreation Commission work plan, if you would. Well, thank you. Uh, Chair and Vice Chair for the uh, that presentation. Um, very excited to, well, congratulations on a very successful 2021, which I know was challenging for everyone, certainly challenging in the parks world as, as well as everybody else. And I'm, I'm very excited about the 2022 work plan, uh, in particular the, the park uh, or the, the natural resources plan and the planning for the parks building. We just had uh, a core team meeting on Saturday, a day long meeting for our for the the strategic plan the Bloomington strategic plan and one of the important things that took up a long conversation was the notion of building places for people to meet and to gather and to to develop the the neighborhood cohesion and, and the the community cohesion and uh, remembering the presentation about these these park buildings I think they fit that bill perfectly and so am very much looking forward to that uh, seeing that design and seeing the plan moving forward because I really think that uh, that and many of the other things that you're working on can go a long way toward accomplishing a lot of the goals that we have laid out and, and are talking about for the for the long-range strategic plan for the city of Bloomington. So well done on that. Uh, council questions. Council Member Lohman and then Council Member D'Alessandro. Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and uh, Manager, I, I'm sure you know what I'm going to ask. Uh, 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 the Chair of the Sustainability Commission um, and not really just that that commission, but uh, uh, really what my question is, is, you know, natural resources really span across a number of different departments uh, uh, in the city. And what I'm curious about, and I know that the, uh, the chair, if he was here, he would ask us, how, how do we intend to uh, involve these other departments and other areas of the city um, to make sure that, 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 that those perspectives and aspects are included uh, when we look at those natural resources plans. Ms. Ketry. Council Member Lohman, members of the council, I'd be happy to answer that question. This uh, plan that we're working on now is currently the perfect example of that collaboration. It's something that came out of the Park System Master Plan. We've been working with the Sustainability Commission, a working group of the Sustainability Commission. Uh, we've been working with our park maintenance team, our natural resources folks on uh, the park maintenance uh, side, and then also our recreation team. So this is really a perfect example of that collaboration. Uh, we're collaborating in the planning of this document. They've been involved every step of the way. Um, and for the implementation of the plan, we will continue that involvement. So it's a, it's a really perfect example. Thank you for bringing it up. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Hi, two quick questions. Thank you for this, by the way. Um, the first question I have is similarly in, 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 that, in that vein, can you describe for folks um, who may not understand the concept of natural resources, what it is and what it isn't for people so that they know kind of the lines of demarcation for what you're attempting to do there? 
I wish, Councilmember D'Alessandro, I wish Renee Clark was here uh, this <laughs> evening. Uh, she's at a training this week. Uh, she is our staff person that has been very actively involved in this project. Um, but what the, the Natural Resource Project is, in, is intending to do is to look at all of the plans that have um, taken place um, within the city of Bloomington uh, relating to natural resources and Hennepin County, um, and uh, the, uh, the River Valley Natural Resource Plan and incorporate that into one document and then plan for uh, natural resources moving forward for the next five to 10 years. So what it is, is it's looking at our natural areas and it's looking at invasive species, what we can improve, um, and how we can uh, reduce the um, invasive species and then replant uh, natural, um, uh, natural species that have uh, been crowded out by the invasives that have moved in. So uh, we really feel like this natural resource plan is a small step in the direction of uh, the work that we're going to be moving forward in uh, natural resources. We do intend to do a really significant natural resource plan that is really going to tackle all of the areas within the city of Bloomington, uh, but that will be a really significant initiative, probably another two-year uh, master planning project that we intend to move forward. We felt it was really important that we have some essentially shovel-ready projects um, to be able to work on uh, relating to natural resources, and this is going to get us uh, that five to ten year plan while we work towards that larger natural resource plan. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Well, I think it did. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate it, Director Catri. I think um, um, when I think of natural resources, it could be a lot of things, right? So some people might have in their mind fish or animals or other things. Other people have plants, but maybe some people have trees. And so I just wanted to be more specific about what we were trying to prioritize in, term of, in terms of tackling. So it sounds like invasive plant species are kind of first on the list, if you will, buckthorn and such. That is correct. Okay. Thank you for that. That is, uh, that is a, a, a high level summary of what we're really focusing on yeah. early on. Okay, great. So the second question I have really quickly is, um, from an operations and maintenance perspective then, um, you know, uh, we've had a lot of conversations about sidewalks and trails recently, and some of that does come from our public works group. Some of it comes from the Parks and Rec subgroup. It comes from our, our conversations around the alternative transportation plan, et cetera. I'm just kind of curious how you all are thinking about um, park maintenance and operations as it relates to sidewalks and trails around those, those areas and how you're, I guess, doing similarly to what you're doing as it relates to some of the other work on sustainability with that area as well. Councilmember D'Alessandro, members of the council, that's a great question as well. Uh, what we are doing as part of this uh, maintenance and operations plan is we're taking every uh, individual area of park maintenance that happens, whether it's uh, trails and paths and sidewalks, to playgrounds, to how we handle turf grass areas, everything that, and buildings, everything you can think of. And uh, we're going to be setting a standard for maintenance. Uh, what we intend to do with that, we're, we're working with a micro business of staff from the recreation team and the park maintenance team, supervisors to, uh, to the park maintenance workers themselves. And we're looking at what we do and we're looking at setting goals for how we would like to maintain our infrastructure in the future. And if there's a difference between what we're currently doing and what we would like to do in the future, uh, we intend to make a recommendation as to changes that we need to make in order to make that happen. Uh, we will be making a recommendation as staff first to the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission. We'll be taking their feedback, and then we'll be making a recommendation specifically to the City Council. So if there's anything in advance of us moving this uh, forward any further, if there's anything specifically that the City Council would like us to focus on, we would love to take that feedback early on. But I can tell you we're making really great progress, and um, as a team, we're really excited about about the recommendations that we're going to have moving forward. It's giving us a really great opportunity at all levels of our organization to look at how we do it, why we do it, and how we can do it better and more efficiently. And uh, I'll just give you one example uh, that came out of our meeting just last week. We were looking at um, how we maintain our parks. And one of the things that has been a frustration to many of us, I'm sure to you as well, is that 
a park really doesn't look finished because we're mowing one day and maybe a couple days later we're coming back and do weed whipping and trimming. So a park really doesn't look finished because then by that time the grass is starting to, you know, so we're not on the same path. So we put it, uh, put the challenge to our team to figure out a way that we can figure out how we can mow and trim on the same day so a park looks great and finished. They came to us with a recommendation of changing the mowing routes, changing the grouping of those routes, and some additional staffing and equipment that they're gonna need, which quite honestly is very achievable. Um, and that's something that we're gonna be incorporating already this year. So that's just one example of changes that we're gonna be making as part of this plan. Mowing one day and then whipping three days later, it, it sounds like my son was in charge, but uh, <laughs> based on how I've seen my yard over the few years. So, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor, and I will say that I believe your kids probably do a much better job of maintaining your yard than mine do. So I've seen your yard, it's it's a nice yard. Um, I got three questions. Um, on the, the natural resources plan, I know that, um, and I just wanna speak for our former council member, uh, Beloga, he had uh, concerns about the plan with regards to the River Valley because it wasn't extended throughout the entire community. And am I correct in understanding that we're going to um, extend that natural resources plan that we did in the Minnesota River Valley throughout all the other locations within the community to look at the needs there uh, and, and make sure we take care of that for him. Councilmember Nelson, eventually we will, yes. So what we're what we're attempting to achieve with this first plan, which is a smaller scale down version, is to put all those plans together and to prioritize the next five to maybe 10 years worth of projects and then set us up for that larger natural resources plan, which would do really exactly what you're describing and put together that longer term detail plan for the entire city. Great, thank you. I know that was important to him. Um, in terms of the park changes, I know that we uh, had approved a number of conceptual changes with regards to eliminated certain features, but adding uh, additional features within neighborhood parks and things like that. Can you talk a little bit to what's going to happen in the next couple of years with this plan and um, how that conversation is going? Because as, as you and I have talked about, sometimes uh, neighborhoods get a little uh, sideways when their their park changes. And, and uh, we just want to make sure we're, we're letting them know that it's going to be better in the long run. But there, there, there's going to be changes in, in that local neighborhood park. Councilmember Nelson, thank you. Yes, what you are uh, describing is uh, what Andy talked about in terms of our service area planning uh, for this year that we will be uh, embarking on. And I'm hoping that this project will be something that we'll be able to kick off, uh, I'm gonna say sometime spring, early summer. Uh, we're working uh, currently on finalizing our request for proposal uh, for consultants to help us with this project. and. Uh, you, you laid it out very well, Council Member Nelson. Uh, what we intend to do is to use the framework that was established as part of the park system master planning process. We took a high level look at all of the parks in the park system. We looked at the different service areas in the city and we tried to um, create but not overly duplicate experiences. We looked at some areas where some amenities probably could be removed and some areas where amenities could and should be added. We definitely will be using that exact framework to start with our service area planning. Uh, what I want you to know, uh, council members and mayor, uh, that the planning that we do on these nine parks moving forward this summer is going to be community driven. We will be going out and meeting our residents where they are. Uh, we're going to be inviting folks into the parks and we'll be having conversations, many of them, uh, with our residents to find out exactly what they would like to see in their parks and how they want to use them. So this isn't an exercise in any of us telling the residents what they want to see in the parks. We want the residents to tell us uh, what they would like in their park system. So we're really looking forward to starting those conversations this year. We would love for the council to be involved in those conversations as well. 
Thank you very much for that. I I really appreciate that because I I'm very excited about having more dog parks throughout the community, bike parks, um, skill tracks, um, all of the different things you put in there. I've heard from people that they'd like more of that, and I I just I think it's a really great opportunity for our community and and appreciate the thoughtfulness and I appreciate the recognition that there will be changes in neighborhood parks and that's sometimes going to be a little bit of a challenge in terms of communication and conversation that they might have to go a little bit farther to go do the specific thing they've been used to in their neighborhood and change is sometimes difficult so uh but thank you for your approach on that of being community directed the last question i have is in terms of automation and this is actually a conversation that goes back a little bit uh, farther but um is the park department looking at like i think we had um uh, things that would automate the lining of fields whether it's soccer or softball or baseball uh, mowing of lawns of things like that that would kind of help me uh help with the maintenance of those items is there anything in the plan coming forward with regards to that type of automation and please um, let me know if i'm not making any sense on that question Council Member Nelson, members of the council, you are making perfect sense um, with that question. And, and you're exactly right. We did buy an automated field striping robot uh, that we've been able to use really successfully in the park system. Uh, it has given us an opportunity to stripe our fields in a much more efficient, uh, faster manner with less impact to the fields themselves. We don't have to drive big trucks on them. We can get on them sooner after the rain. Um, and the best part is it's then freeing up a whole lot of staff who's not standing out there measuring and marking and painting uh, to do other um, uh you know, jobs and, and uh, tasks within the park system. So that is one really perfect example. And those are exactly the types of conversations that we're having as we work on the, uh, the uh, park maintenance and operation plan to try to figure out how we can be smarter, how we can figure out how to best use technology and the resources that we currently have to be more effective. So absolutely, those are the conversations that we're having. Great. Thank you for the information. Always good to hear from you. So have a good evening, I guess. Thanks so much, Councilmember Nelson. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, the line striping robot is named Linus. Is that correct? <laughs> that is correct. I, mean that. Yeah. I was trying to remember that as you were speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we did a, we did a Facebook challenge to, uh, to name our robot. Council, any additional questions, comments on this? Yeah, Mayor, I just wanted to, it's not like, Liney McLiney face or anything like the cell clouds. Stripey McStrike face was a finalist, I believe. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Council, if there are no additional questions or comments, uh, I would look for a motion to adopt the Parks, Arts, and Recreation Commission 2020 work plan. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Councilmember Coulter and a second by Councilmember Martin to adopt the Park, Art, and Recreation 2022 work plan. Hearing no further council discussion on this, Mr. Brillard. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 6-0. Well, thank you so very much. And uh, Chair Peral, thank you for being with us as well. Uh, looking forward to the, the work that's underway. I know that it, it, was, it felt like two long years of a lot of planning and preparation and learning and now it feels like you're kind of right on the cusp of, of a lot of work that is going to get done. And I'm, I'm very excited about it, and I'm sure the community is as well. So thank you much. And if you could extend uh, our thanks to the other members of the, the Park Commission Absolutely. as well, I would greatly appreciate it. Definitely will. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 5.2 on our agenda is a proclamation for Procurement Month. And I'm going to head down to the podium. This is a proclamation for March of 2022 for Procurement Month. And um, I think for a long while, procurement, just the, the act of procuring what we need to run a city, it was 
kind of a back off office function, a kind of behind the scenes kind of thing that that uh, city employees or bureaucrats did. But it's it's really changed, I think, in recent years, and has really become a, a higher level uh, type of work that is a it's a strategic process to align the work of buying and, and spending and, and procuring and purchasing things that the city needs to work uh, in such a way that it matches not only the city's uh, strategic plans or sort of overall operational plans. It's and it's it's really risen in terms of uh, in terms of its uh, visibility and its importance. I think within within city government and within municipal and uh, public sector government throughout uh, throughout the United States. So, so I think it is perfectly acceptable and perfectly uh, applicable here that we uh, dedicate March 2020 as procurement month in the city of Bloomington. Whereas the purchasing, acquisitions, procurement, and materials management professions have a significant role in the quality and efficiency of business and government throughout the United States. And whereas, in addition to the purchase of goods and services, professionals engage in or have direct responsibility for execution, implementation, and administration of contracts, development of forecasts and procurement strategies, supervising and monitoring the flow of storage, and of storage of materials, and development of working relationships with suppliers and other departments within organizations. And whereas purchasing professionals make important contributions to ensure the efficient use of taxpayer dollars by providing efficient service while maintaining the highest ethical standards. And whereas local, state, and federal purchasing professionals are responsible for managing and monitoring billions of dollars of goods and services every year, which directly influences the national and international economies. And whereas the Minnesota chapter of the National Institute of Governmental Purchasing and other associations around the globe are sponsoring activities and other special events to further educate and inform the general public regarding the role of procurement. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim March 2020 as pro 2022 as Procurement Month in the City of Bloomington, signed this day the 7th of March 2022. Uh, we have Dana Chow from our uh, procurement staff here uh, with us this evening. She has specifically asked me not to call her up to make a comment this evening, so I won't do that. But I will offer my thanks to her and to our other professionals working in this area in the city of Bloomington. And if you could pass that on to them, I would greatly appreciate it. All right. Thank you so very much. Item six on our agenda is our consent business. Council Member D'Alessandro, you have our consent agenda tonight. I do, and I have heard from no one that they wanted holds tonight. So if uh, if I'll make one more call for it, especially for those of you virtually, um, anything you want to hold, going once, going twice. Okay, great. Then I will make a motion to approve tonight's consent business. Item six point one through six point ten. Second. <clears throat> motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, a second by Council Member Martin to adopt tonight's consent business as stated. Are there no further council discussion on this? Mr. Brillert. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 6-0. Item seven, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. We have one item under this this evening, item 7.1, which is a public comment regarding the redistricted city council member districts and city precincts. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are in the process of changing uh, our city districts and precincts to match up with the changes made as a result of the 2020 census. And I know we've seen it on the congressional level, we've seen it at the, the state level, and now it's working its way down to the city level, and we have some work to do on it. And uh, wanted to, we're going to get a presentation from our city clerk, Christina Scipioni, and then we're going to open it up for public comment for anybody who wishes to speak to this. So good evening and welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. It's nice to see you again. Um, Today we're excited to, to go through some redistricting maps with you, right, and some proposed changes. Um, can I have you go to the first slide, please, Matt? Thank you. So as a reminder, at its, for those who might be watching at home, um, at its heart, the purpose of our redistricting here in the city is to balance the population between our city council member districts using the most recent census population information. And within our city charter, we have a requirement um, that the difference between the most populous and the least populous district cannot be more than 5%. Um, 
So that's par a portion of what we're doing today with looking at our redistricting maps is looking at the actual city council member districts and seeing how we've moved those, how we're proposing to move those boundaries to, um, to balance those populations. The second piece of redistricting that we do at the city level is ensuring that our precinct boundaries do not cross legislative boundaries. So we all know the state has made changes to its legislative maps. We'll be making changes to our council district maps. And so as a result, we'll need to make changes to our precinct maps to make sure sure that those line up with um, the new legislative boundaries that we have. So as a reminder, our current um, council member districts, um, there's about a 6.2% difference between our most populous and our least populous. Um, District 2 is about 3% under what would be our ideal, right, if everybody had the exact same number of residents um, in their district. District 2 is about 3% under the target or the ideal population, and District 4 is um, a little more than 3% over that target population. So we're not talking about needing a huge change, um, but some adjust adjustments are needed in order to bring us within that 5%. So this is what our, um, our current council districts look like. And the tricky part about this redistricting is that the um, districts that have the smallest and the largest population do not actually touch each other, right? <laughs> and so we had to find a way um, to bring, um, to decrease the population in four, increase the population in two. And so we looked for areas of the city um, where we could make, um, you know, make a small change to the area and have a, a bigger impact in the number of folks that we were moving from one district to another. Um, and so what we ended up doing, if I could have you go to the next slide, or what we're proposing, as you can see here, the cross-hatched areas are the areas that we are proposing um, transitioning to a different council district. So on the east side of the city, we have shifted, shifted some population from four into one. And then on the west side of the city, we have shifted some more population from one into two. And so that then brings us into um, balanced precincts that are with, or balanced districts that are within that 5% threshold that is required by our city charter. And then this would be what the final um, pro proposed product would look like. If I can have you go to the next slide, please. And here's the numbers and how this actually affects the populations within each district. So District 1 sees um, a 6% or 6 person change in population. They have six fewer um, residents. District 2, we see an additional 575 residents. And then District 4 is decreasing its population by 569. So that brings us into a total difference of little less than 2% for all of the city council member districts. And I should mention to District 3, there is no proposed change under this plan. So now we move on to our precinct boundaries, right? And as a reminder, precinct boundaries are administrative boundaries that we use to efficiently and effectively um, provide voting to our residents. Um, and so precinct boundaries, we have to follow legislative boundaries. And then as, we sh as I shared last week, we have some additional goals for our precinct boundaries. And so you'll notice in the new, new map that we have renumbered um, those precinct precincts sequentially. So now District 1 starts with Precinct 1, and it goes through Precinct 7. Um, and the reason we did that is it's, it's a little easier for our residents to understand when we are reporting out council results, especially district council member results. Administratively, it also is a little bit clearer for us if I, you know, if on election day we're doing operations and I say I need you to go to this precinct, our staff immediately know what area of the city it is in, they know what range it's in. It's, and then um, Hennepin County also has shared that it's easier for them to administer absentee voting when we have the sequential precinct numbers. We've also in our proposed map de decreased the number of polling places, or de decreased the number of precincts from 32 to 31. Um, it wasn't a goal of ours to decrease precincts. Um, we wanted to be right around, right around the same number, but given where the legislative lines ran through District 1, um, we would have either have been left with a lot of little inefficient polling places, or we could staff up and provide a little bit better service at some larger buildings within that district. And so um, District 1 did see a decrease in um, precincts by one. Obviously, the population in that district hasn't changed significantly. It's just how we are administering elections in that area. 
And then we really looked at right sizing for uh, our precincts for future growth and then looking at our buildings, what they can handle, um, looking at our parking and making sure that um, we had the appropriate number of residents in those precincts kind of aligned with those buildings. So now we'll go on to, this is our current map. Um, and I'm gonna have you switch then right away to our proposed map. So you can see, look at how nice the numbers are all the way around the city. Um, <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, so I know it's kind of hard right, to take in where the changes are with this map. So I'm gonna have you, Matt, go to the next map for me, please. And that actually shows the cross-hatching is where voters are going to be going to new polling places under this proposed plan. And so we estimate it's about 25% of our residents that are going to be seeing or would be going to new polling locations. Um, all of our residents, except for those in 17, will actually have a new precinct number. Um, but what I've learned in my years administering elections is most folks want to know where they physically go to vote. They don't really know what their polling, their precinct number is. So we don't anticipate the precinct renumbering to cause a lot of concern. Um, but we will need to spend a lot of time educating folks on the correct location to go to vote um, under this plan. And this is really, these changes are really driven by two things, our new legislative boundaries. Um, and that's where you see most of the change in the central part of the city is just with those new legislative boundaries. We have to follow those and so that necessitated changes um, in a large portion of our, of our central part of our city. And then on um, the eastern side of the city, we wanted to kind of right-size some of those precincts. We used to have legislative boundaries in that area that limited what we could do. Um, and now those have been moved over to the other side of the city, and so now we have a little bit more opportunity to have more efficient polling places and to plan for some growth that we know is coming in some of our precincts over in those locations. And then just as a reminder, so tonight we are taking public comment and seeking council feedback on these proposed maps so that we can draft an ordinance um, for consideration at the March 21st meeting. We would have an ordinance for the actual council member redistricting and then a resolution for the precincts and the polling places. And March 29th is the statutory deadline to complete redistricting. Um, council pay has to be um, withheld until redistricting is done if we go past March 29th. Um, and then of course our ongoing efforts throughout this year and next year are going to be sharing information with our residents, especially those whose polling locations have changed. Um, all residents will receive a postcard letting them know what their current polling location is, district, um, all their legislative districts. Uh, but then we'll also be working with our traditional media, the briefing, the social media, our website, um, and reaching out to our community partners, organizations, apartment complexes, um, whomever we have to get that word out. Um, and we have an interdepartmental team that'll be working on that. That concludes my presentation, and I'm excited to any, answer any questions that you might have. Council questions? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a few quick questions here. First of all, um, are there, how many, <coughs> let me see how I wanna phrase this. Mm -hmm. um, of the new polling places, how many of them are current polling places. Does that make sense? How many how many polling places are we? We are not utilizing any, oh, thank you, Mayor and yeah, Council no, Member Colton. We are not utilizing any new buildings for okay. polling places. They are all existing buildings. Okay, okay. Um, and then the other question I have um, is, so my, my recollection is that polling places have to either be in the precinct or within one mile of the border of the precinct. And I'm, I'm noticing it Maybe I'm just not familiar with the map, but it, it seems to me like there are a fair number of polling places that are not within um, the current precinct. I'm wondering um, how many that is. How does that uh, compare to uh, what, what the map was before? Thank you, Mayor and Council Member Coulter. We do have a, a fair number of polling places that are outside of the precinct boundary. We've checked they're all within a mile of that boundary. Um, we haven't made too many changes to how many polling places are located outside of their precinct boundary. I will tell you, especially in the center part of the city, um, we have some polling locations that are actually a little farther than their precinct as you're looking on the map. Um, however, when we looked at where those voters in that location were voting before, 
if we had switched it to the closest location, we actually would have displaced more voters and they would have been going to a new building. And so we did try and take a look at where are folks going right now and tried to keep that as their same polling place as much as possible with some of the precincts. And so it does get a little bit wonky where we have that new district um, or that new legislative boundary that comes through District 1. And a lot of that, um, the reason you see a polling place outside of the precinct boundary is because we want to try and keep um, folks going where they were going as much as we can. <laughs> sure, sure. And I, I assume part of the thought as well was to not have to essentially create new polling places, to keep folks going to places that have been, have traditionally been polling places for probably several years. Mayor and Council Member Coulter, yes, that was, that's part of the goal is to try not to displace residents whenever we can. Sure. Thank you. Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Just Three quick questions. Um, do you know when the uh, Secretary of State website would be updated with the polling location? Because I think a lot of people use the internet to figure out where they should go vote. Uh, when will that information be available? Thank you, Council Member Nelson and Council. Um, that is likely going to be completed in May. Um, we have to wait until the county has redis redistricted its commissioner districts, and they have until April 26th to do that process. And then there's a lot of legwork that needs to go into actually updating our database of all of the addresses, you know, in the entire state. Um, so I would expect mid to late May would be when we would see some, um, some updated information on mnvotes.org. Great. And then to Council Member Coulter's point, I mean, some people are accustomed to going to a certain place all the time, and maybe that has changed for a few people. What happens when people go to a polling place that isn't the one they're supposed to go to? How does how does that how do we help them get to the right place? Thank you, Mayor Council Member Nelson. So we actually, at each of our precincts, we have a greeter judge um, stationed to do just that. They help voters determine if they're in the right polling location. Um, and if they're not, we actually, on our, um, our poll pads that we use to check voters in, we can actually look up their um, voting location and, and print a little ticket that gives them the correct um, voting location and directions to go there um, and what they need when they get there if they need to register to vote. And so that's something we're going to be using a little bit more robustly this year, um, given all of the proposed changes. Um, and so we, and we're going to, you know, look at making sure we have enough to have at least at least one greater judge, if not two, at all of our polling locations so that we have plenty of staff there available to assist and get voters to the right location. That's fantastic. The, the only recommendation I would suggest is having uh, maybe more at those where there are changes um, so that we're prepared for that. Um, and then I, you did note that one of the uh, districts had fewer polling locations, and um, I certainly don't want to suggest anything unsavory about that, but I, I know that that is a concern uh, nationwide about reducing polling locations. Has this been looked at from an equity standpoint and making sure that people have access to voting in a convenient manner within our community? Thank you, Mayor and Council Member Nelson. I will say that we, um, our goal when we were looking at all of our precincts is not to overload any of them, even if they're a large building and even if we would have a lot of space. And so um, we used a target of no more than um, 3,000 over 18 population. Now that's not registered voters, right? Because not everybody over 18 is registered, but that was kind of our benchmark. And I will share um, in speaking with some of our, our um, our colleagues in other cities, my colleagues in other cities, most other cities were looking at more of a four to 5,000 range. Um, so I would say we're still being pretty, we're still keeping our precincts pretty small compared to a lot of our other communities. Um, and with the increase in absentee voting, um, we may see even fewer people coming to our polling places in fewer lines. Um, but it was definitely one of the reasons that we didn't make it a goal to decrease or try to um, to, to decrease the number of precincts within the city because we do want to make sure that we're keeping that level fairly low. Um, it just happened to be in District 1. We were able to still make that happen um, and still have nice, large, efficient areas to serve our voters. Well, I appreciate your focus on making sure it's easy for people to get in and vote, and I, I think that's extremely important and one of the reasons why Minnesota has one of the highest voting rates in the, in the country. 
um, and let's keep that up. So thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to make a recommendation. I think that your plan for communication on this is great, and I really appreciate all the hard work you've done. Um, at some point, I'm going to sit down with you and actually see like the sausage making underneath all of this because I'm super interested. Um, you and I can geek out on that together. <laughs> um, but I wanted to make ask you if you would, when you do the communications that you do, if you would make sure that you identify um, who the who the, um, the the council member representation is for those those um, members, whether you just put that on the postcard or whatever, the reason I'm saying that is because number one, um, you'll be you'll be picking up new registrants, new voter registrants, and they might not know because they've moved here recently or whatever who their representative is, and also so that we can be helpful to, you know, providing communication if they want to contact us and talk to us about these changes or anything like that. We can be an advocate for that information. So uh, that would be my only recommendation. But thank you, appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. So additional questions? So along those lines, I, I think you and I talked earlier today, and I think we, in, in our time here in Bloomington, I think we've changed polling places, I think four times, at least three times, but I think four times. And if I recall, and if you could just help me remember, for each registered voter, I don't think it's to the household, I think it's the each registered voter gets a postcard with the, the notation of the new polling place. I think it mentions the old polling place as well and that they have a new polling place. Is, can, can you just go through quickly what the official, uh, in addition to the, the social media and the briefing and so on, what is officially required by the state of Minnesota in terms of what you deliver to uh, registered voters or, or voters in a, a city? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so state law requires, actually it's done at a county level, but they require that um, we send a postcard to, it can be to either every household with a registered voter or to every registered voter. And um, Hennepin County has made the decision to send a postcard to every registered voter. Um, and it includes a notice saying you've you know, we've gone through a redistricting process, which means you may be voting at a new polling location. Um, and then you turn the postcard over and it has their very specific information. What congressional district, legislative districts they live in, what city council district they live in, school district, um, county commissioner district, any district that you live in, it's got listed on that card for them. Um, and then as well as their polling location. Um, and then information, links to information, website information of how to, you know, find out more information about their um, polling location, how to find out more information about what's going to be on their ballot, when the next election is. Um, so unfortunately, it's a postcard, so we can't put probably as much as I would love to have on there. Um, but that is what's statutorily required and will be sent out um, probably about mid-May. mid, mid -May. Um, It'll come out kind of before absentee voting starts for the primary election. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Council, additional questions, comments? This is uh, officially, this isn't a public hearing, but what we want to do is set this up as an opportunity for public comment for members of, of, the, of the public to, to bring forward, forward any questions or any comments, concerns, anything they would like to know or uh, learn more about regarding uh, the, the redistricted council member districts and city precincts. So with that in mind, I'm going to open up the public comment for item 7.1 right now. So uh, anyone in the council chambers wishes to speak on item 7.1? Jerome, is there anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 7.1? No one dials in for this item. You may continue. Thank you. Last call for anyone in the council chambers to speak. And we'll give it just another second here to see if anybody jumps on the phone line very quickly and I'll make one last call to Jerome. Jerome, anyone chiming in for item 7.1? No one dies in for this item. You may continue, sir. Thank you. Seeing no one coming forward, council, I will close the public comment period on item 7.1. So, Ms. Scipioni, what are our next steps? Our next steps, um, now that um, we've 
had review of the draft council member districts, we will be preparing the actual ordinance, um, the proposed ordinance for that redistricting process. Those will be posted on our website. On, that will be posted on our website on Thursday, and then we will be, will be coming back March 21st um, for the official ordinance consideration and the public hearing on that ordinance. Very good. Thank you. And, and I think it's, an, it's important for folks to, to realize if you're watching, I mean, it, this sounds like a lot of moving parts and everything changing, but this literally, this happens every 10 years. And there are some movement, there is some movement every 10 years. And uh, again, in my time being involved in all of this, our city clerk's office is just top notch and make sure that everybody knows what's going on, knows where to vote. Uh, the information is out there in a variety of different formats and a variety of different avenues. and. I certainly expect that to continue again and, and have full confidence in our city clerk's office to make sure that uh, even with all of the changes, we're, it's going to be another stellar year for, for voting in, in Bloomington. I, I really expect that and, and have no doubt about that. Councilmember Coulter? Thank you, Mayor. If I could, um, just a, a request that, you know, obviously once we are, are done with our redistricting process, the county still has theirs. and. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who would appreciate being kept apprised of, of how that moves forward and how that changes within the county and, and all of that as well. So maybe in the one weekly or, or something that would be helpful information to have. Certainly. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank and if you could pass uh, our thanks on to your entire staff, because I know there's a lot going on and a lot of folks working on this. So thank you so very much. Thank you. All right. Jerome, that is our last opportunity for public input in tonight's meeting. So I would like to thank you for your help tonight and tell you you can have the rest of the night off. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, Jerome. We'll move on to item eight on our agenda, our organizational business. A couple items on this, uh, under this topic tonight. And our first is item 8.1, where we're going to start a discussion about the 2023 budget process. Seems like we just finished the 2022 budget process. And uh, Kari Carlson, our budget manager, is going to kick off the discussion about how we're going to handle the 2023 budget process. Good evening. Good to see you face to face. Yes. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's good to be here in person. And um, yep, it's never too early to get started on the next year's budget. Um, we just officially submitted our 2022 budget document to the Government Finance Officers Association uh, last week. So that is all wrapped up and here we go for 2023. So I think Matt's bringing up my presentation here. Here we go. So um, if we can go to the next slide with the agenda. What I'm going to be discussing with you this evening, um, the last uh, couple months, we've been uh, meeting with the council and getting feedback from last year's budget process. Uh, what went well last year, what changes we might need to make, um, if there's different ways you'd like to see the information, and ideas for um, improving our public engagement and keep expanding on that. And so I'm going to go over some themes from those uh, budget discussions that we had with council members and then talk about the budget process that's planned for this year, ideas for public engagement opportunities, and just go over the calendar that we've got laid out for this year. So we go to the next slide. So themes that came out from those discussions. Um, first one is that um, the council really appreciates the transparency that we've added to the budget process in recent years, the communication, the brand new website that we have with all the budget information in one place, the videos that we've done. Um, they would like us to continue and expand um, the outreach efforts that we should meet people where they are at when we're coming to do public engagement on the budget. And um, the idea of having town hall meetings again, like we did a few years ago, came up. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, another theme that came through discussions with you um, that to communicate um, a clear message. So when we're talking about um, the budget. So we want to make sure that we still have all the details, all the numbers for the members of the council that really want to dive in and see that or the members of the public, but that also to kind of bring it up at a high level too and really uh, focus in on what the main talking points are of like, this year's budget for the council and for the public. Um, like focusing in on those main issues 
and it's just in including that supporting narrative um, or challenges or changes that go along with the numbers that we're presenting. Um, another, uh, some advice of when we're, when we're especially when we're going into future years and we're trying to predict predict what the um, future year's tax levy increase might be, to maybe do that more as a range as opposed to a certain percentage um, because we know things can change a lot in, um, in future years. So being more realistic and having kind of a range of where that's going to land rather than a specific number. And then um, also when we're doing public engagement, um, if kind of focusing in on specific sections of the budget as opposed to the entire budget. And um, especially in places where you're wanting some input and some decisions, um, some input for your decisions on the budget um, to make it kind of more manageable for the public. So the process that's planned for our um, this coming year is that the departments are going to be submitting requests for both a 2023 budget as well as a conceptual 2024 budget for our 30 annually budgeted funds. So that's similar to last year. Um, we're going to incorporate these um, the council suggestions into our budget process, and um, we'll we will be factoring in um, the new Bloomington Tomorrow Together strategic plan into the 2023 budget process. So if there are things that come out of that that are going to require funding or positions or things like that, we will highlight that and um, make sure that that is very clear when we're presenting the budget. Um, overall, this year's schedule is going to be really similar to what we just did last year. Um, I think overall that worked really well. And so we're going to be doing a very similar um, schedule with the budget. Um, however, we, work, we are going to focus on expanding the public engagement and trying some new things. And um, I think we're all aware of how um, what a good thing this has been in the, since um, 2020, um, where we've really brought the public a lot more into the, the process. Um, it, it's created awareness. It enhances accountability. It expands representation for the budget, it improves transparency, it cultivates trust, and it just leads to better outcomes. So that's why we are um, have a focus on that and want to keep expanding our efforts. Some of the ideas that came up from speaking with council members and um, staff, um, having tables at the farmer's market, uh, potentially maybe some of the council members might want to join me um, or some other staff there, um, also possibly at Summer Fet. Um, we just heard about the um, park service area, all the community engagement that's going on with that. We can maybe tack on to that a little bit and um, be there as well. Possibly something with National Night Out block captains. Um, maybe we can meet with them before National Night Out and get some information out where they can distribute it at the parties and we can kind of bring it back for some input. Um, if, there's, if we do have town hall meetings um, this uh, year, having budget be a part of that. Um, possibly coffee with the budget manager. I don't know what a big, it's not like coffee with the cop. It's not as exciting, but maybe there would be some residents that would like to talk about the budget and have some coffee with me. Um, uh, there was an idea about having a property tax like information open house where just explaining the property tax statements. I did that in a video with the communications department this year, and we put it on our website and on social media, but um, I think just explaining the parts of the property statement that's not all the city, you know, it's like a third of it is the city, but it's also school district in Hennepin County, and just how the assessed values really, ch um, really can change um, from year to year what you're paying in property tax. Um, some other ideas um, have, I, I would present at a chamber meeting, um, chamber of commerce meeting, to talk to the business community and get some input from them as well. We do have a lot of um, kind of standing relationships and meetings that we have for, with community partner organizations. We tapped into that in 2020 when we were facing the budget crisis. So um, reaching out to them and um, getting input from them. When we do, we're not going to have a public works open house this year but or home fair, but in future years that would be another place where we could go and um, talk to the public. I think we still do... Um, want to have virtual public budget sessions on Zoom because I know a lot of people are 
kind of zoomed out, but for some people that works really well, and that's really the only way that they can participate is from home. We'll of course use Let's Talk Bloomington as a tool to get information, and we'll still do social media and videos. Um, so on the um, budget calendar here, so I'm not gonna read through everything. I put everything on here just so you had the information, but um, a lot of January and February is kind of more internal and wrapping up last year's budget book and submitting reports. Um, just today, uh, we met with our um, Emily Larson, she's our liaison in Community Outreach Engagement Division, and um, kind of talking through what we're gonna be doing for public engagement. Um, checking in with um, ELT and council now. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'll be back. Um, just gonna do a brief presentation on the 2022 budget book that we just published, and then Matt Gershmill is going to be doing a presentation on the latest assessment report and talking about how that is going to be, um, how the assessed values are gonna be affecting property taxes. Um, on the next slide, I've got some things in blue here where, um, again, April's more internal, just getting ready to get everything into the budget, but um, in May, I'm gonna be checking in with the executive leadership team, but also with the council and um, one of the things that we'll want, we'll have a lot more information about how the budget is the very preliminarily coming together and the questions that you would like us to ask the public. So as we're doing public engagement events, the things that you would like input on for decisions um, that are coming in the budget. And then we'll do our citywide kickoff um, in June. That's when the departments are gonna be submitting their requests. And then in June, we're gonna start earlier with our public engagement this year than we did last year. So. Um, so we have more of an opportunity to get that information to the council. So um, I know when Emily uh, Larson has come and talked about the spectrum of engagement and there's informing and consulting. So in earlier in this year, it's gonna be con consulting. So we'd like to um, ask questions and get their information so we can get that to the council. So we're gonna have something from the, that list I showed earlier. Uh, we're working on kind of honing in on what exactly we're gonna be doing, but we'll have something in June, at least one thing. And if we go to the next slide, so in, um, also in July and in August, we'll also be doing um, public engagement events as well. And I have consult there, because we're gonna be asking specific questions and getting information and making sure they know that we will be sharing this with the council. And we'll be sharing it, um, there's a special budget meeting on August 22nd, and um, similar to last year, and that's before we, you set the preliminary levy. And so we'll let them know, we'll let the public know that is where we're gonna be sharing information with you and discussing that. Um, so then as we get into September um, and then the preliminary levy is set, um, the public engagement's gonna switch a little bit more to informing and not just you know informing that this is what it is because there's still opportunities to give input, but kind of informing on what decisions were made and why. Um, so that we're kind of closing that loop with them and not just having an event and not getting back to them. So we want to inform them on decisions that have been made on, um, and why and why that was. So then we get to um, October. Um, we'd like to have a session in October as well, it's still kind of more on that informing. Um, and then um, in October is when we're gonna start seeing the budgets coming through for approval. So it'll be the the special revenue funds that don't have a property tax input, you'll see that. Um, and then if we go to November, we're still gonna have in November the utility, um, the utility rate public hearing and those budgets and the internal service funds. Um, well, on November 21st is going to be the, the special budget meeting that's, um, special council meeting that's just for the budget. And then in December, um, the property tax hearing um, is going to be, the public hearing is going to be on December 5th. So um, a lot of that schedule is pretty similar to what we just did. I think it worked well, and I think the input we had from you is that it was nice to kind of spread that out a bit, um, and, and rather than bringing them all at once. Um, and so we're gonna stick with that plan, and as you can see, we're gonna just weave in a little bit more of the public engagement and do it earlier in the process. So um, that is our plan. Um, any ideas for um, 
any changes to that or additional ideas for public engagement or things you think maybe we should not do? Thank you for that. I appreciate the information. I appreciate the detailed outreach and engagement plan through the calendar. I, I think it's a, an effective way of getting after it. Council questions? Council member? No, uh, we comments or questions? How about that? <laughs> Council member Martin, then Council member Lowman. Council member Martin. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, first off, I, I just wanted to acknowledge and, and thank you for, I know uh, I, I was in a budget conversation with you and Council member Lowman, and I know we, we brought up being intentional about having this be an opportunity to introduce the community the, to the strategic plan through the budget process, and I'm glad to see that here. Um, as well as kind of providing those more focused opportunities for public engagement on the budget as opposed to kind of dropping the whole stack and saying kind of what do you think. So I, just to maybe draw a line between those two potentially, especially with the, uh, the public facing events, the farmers markets or the coffees, um, things of that nature. It seems like we have uh, an awful lot of really exciting plans, whether that's our kind of rotating fire station projects or the park system master plan as we're looking at different focus areas and using uh, both the, the budget public outreach as well as the project specific outreach that maybe Park may be doing uh, to say here is going to be the near term budget impacts we're projecting for the projects we're discussing right now today. And let's give you kind of a preview of as these rotating plans continue forward, what those costs may be like in the future. So we can say if you're really excited about this and you're tuned in and you're checked in, let's have this be a conversation about what kind of investment do you want to make in projects like these? Because it's my gut reaction, we might be kind of surprised if, if folks see a really cool playground project, uh, how they may be willing to invest in, in even more ambitious things as they look at those uh, opportunities down the line. So, yeah, just kind of from both ways. Thank you. Councilmember Lohman. Yes, Kari, if you want to have some coffee, I, I'm happy to have some coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we could get out there and, and talk budgets. Um, so uh, again, thank you uh, uh, for putting this together. Uh, always as ambitious as I've ever seen it. it seems like each year we kind of take it up a, a, a new uh, layer and hopefully the city manager tipped you off. And I think I asked this uh, during our uh, conversation with uh, uh, council member Martin, um, you know, every conference I go to, um, I get a card uh, from one of the vendors that has these, these interesting, uh, uh, you know, these budget uh, applications that can be played. And then uh, um, I, I uh, have a stack of uh, the manager's cards and I pass them off. I say, well, our manager uh, will get right back to you and uh, uh, let you know if we're interested in that. And so I'm curious, um, you know, part of my, my interest in that has always been, you know, like, like we did last year, we had a dedicated group of folks who were, um, uh, you know, kind of, got into the weeds on the budget on a few items. And I'm just looking for the opportunity for uh, those folks that are out there who are very budget minded to see if they've got an opportunity to take a crack at our budget. To, and I don't, and I know there's kind of a, a kind of a trade off to that. I know we've kind of talked about that because, you know, you have to be kind of knowledgeable. And so I'm kind of interested in opportunities like that, either that, that app, those types of applications or something that we might build on to our Bloomington learn to lead. Uh, to give a little more of a uh, of a, a specific opportunity, and so I wish we could talk a little bit more about that. Um, hopefully, it gave you that tip off that I might come with that question today. Uh, yes, Mayor and Councilmember Lohman, um, we have looked at softwares like you're describing, where residents can go and um, put in numbers on the in the software and kind of move things around. Um, right after or right when the pandemic hit some of those softwares they kind of gave us a, a grace period to try the software for free to kind of just help things out and we did look at them a little bit um it was it was hard to use in that it made seems made things seem really simplistic that you could just say oh you just take some money from police and you put it over here and you know and ah the you know the budget's you know balanced but um we could, I think as we're looking through this um, community engagement plan um, with uh, co-ed and there might be some things that we, like some facilitation type exercises that we could do, maybe not actually, you know, purchasing the software, but, um, you know, giving residents if they're interested in doing something like this, you know, different things where they have to put together the budget with only, you know, so many resources, like maybe more, you know, rather than a software, um, but to try something like that. 
Um, but we'll, we will look into um, see if we can some, do something like that where it's a workshop where you're actually having to figure out how you would, you know, balance the budget. Thank you. Very appreciative. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lohman, uh, appreciate the question, and, and Kari's correct about um, you know, the software and uh, how, how um, informative it is uh, in those sort of exercises, those balancing exercises. One of the things we're also looking at, though, is um, how we build out our performance reporting. And uh, I think that the, the more that we can do to provide dashboards on performance metrics, uh, the more um, transparent uh, how we operate and how the budget uh, corresponds to our operations it becomes for people. So I think over the next couple of years, what you're likely to see is a pretty significant investment in, in efforts around dashboard reporting uh, related to actual operational performance. Thanks for that uh, additional piece. And I'll hold off uh, over the next trip of having the uh, passing your card out. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, uh, Kari, I really appreciate this and uh, the outreach and everything like that. Um, I think that the idea of getting out in front of people with information at Neighborhood Night Out, that the summer fet at uh, the farmer's market is all good. And I just want to comment that, you know, I uh, I would love to have coffee and talk about budgets. And I, I have no idea who wouldn't want to get together and have coffee and talk about budgets. So um, I, I think you're doing a good job. And as always, I, I appreciate the city's focus on getting this information out to people. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. I just wanted to thank you for your willingness to do that. And uh, it's, I think that's the right direction to go. Like people kind of, they, they want to understand this. They want to understand where the money goes. They want to uh, learn about this. So the more opportunities you can do that, especially as we're able to do those things is good. So. Thank you, and uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember yeah. D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, great to see you, Ms. Carlson. appreciate you being here. <clears throat> My only uh, comment was um, I, it can be very complicated, and, I, and I th this is going to be about residential, although I think co commercial folks and our renters probably have a similar question here. I think I mentioned this to you when we talked um, about helping our renters who don't necessarily directly get impacted by <clears throat> our tax decisions, um, but for them to understand how that might affect them. <clears throat> Pardon me. But um, one of the areas of opportunity we have, I think, just to create awareness is around the calendar. The, the other jurisdictions that also present their calendar of opportunity for public comment, for example, or other things like that, <clears throat> if our budget calendar included those, people would get a sense for what else they could be participating in, if that makes sense. Councilmember Coulter. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, um, I think you achieved quite an accomplishment by presenting something in Councilmember Nelson not having any questions. <laughs> so I just felt the need to point that out. Um, the other piece, frankly, I'm I'm worried between the coffee and the table at Summerfet that folks are just going to have too much fun with our budget discussions, and we're going to set the standard just impossibly high. But um, in all seriousness, uh, one. Uh, comment that I would have is as far as outreach and and you know who who you're looking to get in front of. Um, we have a number of very active and and very involved faith communities within Bloomington, and I think um, those are folks who would be very interested in this conversation as well. Um, and the other piece, and I don't know how much this has factored into your your discussion. You know when I when I talk with folks about the budgets. You know, we, we talk about sort of different budgets, right? We talk about the general fund and and, and um, enterprise funds and so on. And folks are more interested in specific department budgets. They want to know, you know, what's going to parks, what's going to police and, and so on. So um, 
you know, obviously we don't adopt budgets that way, the way they do in, in some other cities. But um, I think in terms of presenting the information, um, that kind of sort of departmental focus would be more helpful for folks and more informative, frankly. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Coulter. Uh, one thing I will say with the budget document that we just published, um, about three years ago, we changed the format where we we used to present it in the different fund types, but now we do that by department. Um, so the, the book is in a department format, um, but I'll look into it as we're presenting the information to kind of do that more um, during the presentations as well. Hey, back, Councilmember D'Alessandro. See if I can try this again. Okay. I, think, I think you understood what I was trying to say Ms. Carlson, um, uh, I think, you know, I, I, for one, oftentimes get caught off guard, for example, when the school board levy comes up because I'm paying attention to other things and then it shows up. It, but I think if our calendar, our citywide calendar, since we're kind of at the end of the train, if you will, of all the levies that get established, if we could help people understand this is what's going to happen when so that they can, for example, I don't know, come to Hennepin County's meeting and, you know, yell at them <laughs> as opposed to us. I don't know. But, you know, the idea is that, like, people care, right? They care about how those dollars are being used. But I don't think I, – I think oftentimes by the time they come and talk to us, <clears throat> a lot of the decisions about that – the total number of dollars that they're going to be paying in taxes has been decided already. And – then, then you know the amount of money that we're talking about is a small percentage on the on the whole for that. So if, if you could just assist with with in the calendaring even of of identifying those things so that people have a place to go to understand what else will be affecting the that truth and taxation at the end of it all, I think that would be good. So apologies again for my <clears throat> allergies. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So you mentioned, obviously you had meetings with all of the council members and we provided feedback that you, you shared with us. And I know you've met with the executive leadership team and other members of the staff about different ways you could do things. Has there been any opportunity, have, have you heard back from members of the public, residents saying, you know, this is great, but if you did this, it would be a lot better and I could understand it a little bit better. Have, have you had opportunities to collect some of that information and do, has that shown up at all in your, your plans for the coming year? Um, Mayor, a council, uh no, we have not. That's a really good idea. So um, that is something we could we could work on too. Um, just asking the public how, uh, what kind of information they would like, and how what kind of event would be helpful for them to. And I think that would be a worthwhile conversation mm -hmm. to see because I think we we might hear some interesting things. And and I agree to go where they are is an important piece of it, but to get uh, feedback and, and ideas from the from residents, I think would be helpful also. Thank you. Mr. Verbrugge, you moved your microphone. No? Okay. Right. Council, anything else? Well, very good. Uh, so we will see you again in April. Is that correct? Um, March 21st. March 21st. We'll be back with right. Matt Gershmill, the city. Oh, that's president. right. Look forward to Mr. Gershmill's presentation. Always do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 8.2 on our agenda is an update on the Bloomington sales tax. And we've got Mr. Verbrugge and I think Lori Economy Scholler, our CFO, is here to talk about it. That is correct, Mr. Well. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'm going to do the uh, majority of the talking here. Lori is certainly available as a uh, resource here if you have uh, finance specific questions. So, as uh, one of the things we committed to the Council and to the public is that we're going to have uh, frequent updates regarding the Bloomington sales tax. Okay, so that's what we want to do tonight. I'm going to start to bring up my presentation here. So uh, I haven't done this in a while. So if I mess this up, don't, uh, you know, be gentle. So uh, there we go. Hey, looks like I might have figured it out. Did I get it? All right. So I just need to go to the slideshow and then we'll be ready to go. So um, the, the issue we're talking about here tonight is the Bloomington sales tax, and that is a request that the city council is making of the state legislature uh, to authorize a locally uh, generated sales tax as additional revenue to the city. So I think it's important when we talk about this that we always lead with why. Why is it that we're doing this? Uh, we have 
tried to communicate over the last five or six years to the city uh, uh, residents that Bloomington's age as a community means that a lot of the facilities that we are delivering services from have reached a, a point in time where they need significant reinvestment or in some cases replacement. Um, we have a number of facilities that uh, are approaching functional obsolescence and those, um, those facilities, if they're going to continue to provide excellent services, need to be updated and, and made more contemporary. So as the council is aware, we're in the process of replacing our fire stations right now. Um, we just approved uh, uh, another fire station reconstruction a couple weeks back. And we have a new fleet maintenance uh, uh, building that is going to be uh, hopefully constructed here in the next couple of years because it's operating out of a facility that is um, undersized for the type of apparatus we have, which is a similar situation with the fire stations. And then we have a, a number of facilities, uh, Bloomington Ice Garden and, and others. All of these facilities are in the neighborhood of or older than 50 years of age. Okay? And uh, it becomes a pretty expensive proposition to have to reinvest in a lot of these properties. So going back to when the city council first started talking about this in 2015 or 2016, is trying to figure out a plan for how do we make these necessary improvements and still do it in a way that is, um, is not uh, overly burdensome for the property taxpayer, because obviously these are going to be expensive projects. Traditional way of getting these projects done is to do it through the property taxes that cities uh, will usually sell um, long-term uh, bonds, 20-year bonds, uh, and then we have debt service every year. Um, as, we've, as we've looked at what our options are, we've uh, realized that the state legislature has provided an option to cities uh, to utilize a local option sales tax, and they have some rules around that. And one of those rules is it has to be uh, a regionally significant project. So as we've evaluated uh, the, the replacement or reinvestment needs that we have, we're looking at those projects that do have some sort of a regional component to them in, in how we provide services. So that's why we are looking at a Bloomington sales tax is because uh, the projects that we are proposing be funded are ones that are serving people beyond our community. And so the, the rationale is that it shouldn't just be a cost that is borne by the residents of Bloomington uh, to maintain those facilities that are providing um, necessary services to people uh, who come to our community. Okay. So um, the local option sales tax is not uh, something that is out of the mainstream. There are around seven, around 80 uh, cities in the state of Minnesota that have received this authorization from the legislature uh, locally. Uh, it's uh, their core cities, but also more recently suburbs such as Excelsior and Oakdale and Dinah and Maple Grove uh, have been approved uh, for a local option sales tax. So it is becoming a much more um, uh, regular request among communities, not just in outstate Minnesota, but in the metro area. Uh, what we have, uh, what we have proposed to the legislature is that we would um, be able to collect about eleven million dollars a year in local option sales tax that is generated in Bloomington. Uh, we calculate from that amount that we could um, finance projects uh, of about one hundred fifty million dollars in total value over a twenty-year period based on that revenue. And so back in January, the city council approved a resolution that we forwarded to the uh, chair of the House Tax Committee and the Senate Tax Committee at the Minnesota Legislature, uh, indicating the, the city's intent to request the local option sales tax. And so now we're working our way through the legislative process. And in fact, there's a hearing scheduled for this week uh, for all of the cities that are requesting a local option sales tax. And it's a long list of cities. So the, the House Tax Committee's Property Tax Subdivision uh, will be hearing those requests at a meeting this week. So in order to determine some of these numbers, we asked the University of Minnesota Extension Service 
to provide information about how much sales tax could be generated. And the most recent report that we had um, from uh, last July uh, was actually up through 2019. So the effects of the pandemic aren't necessarily represented yet. So I'll come back to that. Uh, so what is the Bloomington sales tax? Uh, what, what we are requesting of the legislature is it would be a one half of one cent on uh, all uh, retail sales um, that are items that are currently taxable. We're not asking for any changes in tax law. So things that are currently tax exempt, such as food, uh, and clothing and uh, necessities like uh, baby products and feminine products are uh, not taxable currently, and they would not be if the uh, local option sales tax were granted. The study from the Minnesota Extension Report says that about 75% of the revenue would be generated from people outside of Bloomington. Okay? And that's a really important uh, note for why this is uh, a proposition that the city of Bloomington is interested in pursuing. So the, the, the way that we look at this is that the local option sales tax provides less impact to Bloomington residents than a property tax would for these same projects. And important to note that if uh, the legislature does grant a Bloomington sales tax, that uh, voters in Bloomington would still have to approve each of the projects that are being proposed. So uh, getting through the legislative process is not the end of the process, is that Bloomington voters uh, will be able to weigh in. So let's talk about the, the uh, study that was done to uh, give us the, the data that we're confident uh, in regarding the sales tax generated. University of Minnesota Extension Service is a partnership between the university uh, and the federal, state, and local governments. They do a lot of in-depth analysis for scientific uh, research and, and uh, public policy issues. Uh, like I said, the report that we received last July uh, was up through 2019. Uh, so the effects of the pandemic weren't represented in that study. We will be going back to the extension here in the not too distant future because we expect that uh, uh, sales tax data for 2020 will be available uh, after April 1st of this year. Now, here's what we expect to see. This won't be a surprise. The sales tax revenue is probably going to go down for 2020 um, because just about all economic activity went down for 2020. Right? But interestingly, we may see some, um, some data in there that will help us, and that is uh, uh, maybe being able to spot where we've had a, a uh, phenomenon that has changed the way that people um, shop. And during the, uh, during the pandemic, much more commerce is occurring over the Internet uh, than it has historically, and people are less reliant on making uh, purchases in brick and mortar uh, and conducting more of their um, retail activity online. So it'll be interesting to see if that uh, is beginning to materialize in the information for 2020. So uh, why, why are we interested in this? As we do the analysis of what the impact is for a Bloomington property taxpayer, if we were to fund the projects that are being proposed, uh, through a property tax, it would cost the median value home about $211 per year. If we utilize the Minnesota Extension Service data, which tells us that about 75% of the sales tax revenue will be generated from people outside Bloomington, that means that the average household would see an impact of about $72 a year on sales tax. Uh, so it's about one third of the cost to a household in Bloomington to get the same uh, value and benefit of these projects that are being constructed. So the proposed projects again, um, like I said, $11 million revenue being generated is our assumption. Uh, I mentioned in the prelude that uh, we have a number of facilities that need significant investment or replacement. Uh, and that the Bloomington sales tax shifts the cost um, of th those projects to a broader base of taxpayers outside of Bloomington. So the, the first one is the Bloomington Ice Garden renovation. Uh, this project would include replacement of our refrigeration system. The R22 refrigerant uh, is no longer um, permitted to be sold or distributed. 
Uh, and so we're having to uh, try to acquire as much uh, R22 that's left in the, in the marketplace as possible, but we know that that is a finite amount. And so uh, this, is, this is a non-negotiable. We have to change our refrigeration system. Um, we also have to uh, replace the roof on the, prod, on the building, and we have major mechanical um, that needs to be replaced as well. We have ADA accessibility issues. Uh, one of the significant changes is to downsize rink number three from an olympic size sheet of ice to a regulation or standard size sheet of ice. Um, Olympic sheets were all the rage back in the 80s because everybody was still giddy from our Olympic gold medal. And uh, <laughs> we've come to find out that, not, uh, you know, for, especially for youth hockey, it's, the larger sheet of ice is just not um, the, the best situation for, uh, for youth hockey, which is uh, the majority of use that happens there. Uh, adding new high school locker rooms, adding additional uh, dry land training area, and just generally enhancing our guest experience in that facility. Uh, the um, regional impact, so why would this project qualify uh, as being regionally significant? You can see some of the numbers on the left there. Uh, about 90% of the teams that participate in, in Baja's tournaments every year are from outside Bloomington. About 60 to 70 percent of all the ice that is rented uh, in the in the summer is for groups outside of Bloomington, and so there's a significant amount of activity occurring that is benefiting, uh, or the utilization is by parties from outside Bloomington. Okay, so this is a regionally significant project by that definition. Community Health and Wellness Center. This project would uh, integrate our public health and our uh, community center into one facility, replacing the Creekside Community Center uh, that is located at Penn and 98th, uh, and um, also replacing the public health building, which is a, a very, like I said, functionally obsolete, undersized um, uh, building at, that's located at Old Shakopee Road and Logan. And uh, in this concept, what we would be doing is utilizing a community health and wellness center uh, to essentially be the epicenter of how we deliver um, public health services to our community. And it's not just our community. Again, the regional nature of this is that Bloomington is part of a tri-city consortium, including Edina and Richfield, for the delivery of public health services. Uh, and so we are providing um, public health services to those two communities and would continue to do so uh, utilizing this model. And it also allows us to provide uh, more uh, services from a community center type structure than what we're doing currently. Creekside is, is for the most part, um, devoted to serving seniors. And so uh, this allows us to do something that uh, benefits a, a broader, um, a, a broader uh, representation of the community as a whole. Uh, Dwan Golf Course Improvements. Again, this is an aging facility. You can see about 60% of uh, our patrons uh, are from outside of the city of Bloomington. Uh, over the last three years, uh, Dwan has either been the most uh, golfed or second most to golf or third most golfed facility in, in the Twin Cities. Uh, so the number of rounds that are played there it is a very popular course. Uh, and again, the clubhouse there is, um, is uh, in very, very poor repair. Uh, and very undersized for the activity that's occurring there. So the project would be a replacement of the clubhouse and um, general improvement of the user experience. And then finally, a Center for the Arts expansion. Uh, the, the Center for the Arts here at Civic Plaza is a uh, very well-used facility. We have seven, seven resident arts organizations that are um, tenants in the Center for the Arts and all of those organizations are frankly bursting at the seams. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a really good problem to have that the arts organizations in Bloomington are having uh, tremendous success and they're continuing to grow. What that does is it strains the building and, and strains our capacity to um, actually accommodate them in all of their needs. Uh, so the, the idea with the expansion is that we would uh, allow for the growth of all of those organizations and still be able to do it here on our campus. Uh, 
the regional uh, nature of this is that uh, you can see the map there where we draw audiences um, very heavily from 11 counties surrounding us. Um, but interestingly, we actually have in the database of the ticket office uh, 1,100 zip codes that are represented uh, from around the entire country. Uh, so the, the, the impact and the appeal of the Center for the Arts isn't just uh, the local metropolitan area. It expands even beyond that. Um, so if ever there's a project that meets the regional significance, this is that too. So uh, again, I want to hit some of the frequently asked questions uh, for people who may be hearing this for the first time. Uh, the approval of process, again, is we have to meet that statutory requirement for regional significance in the projects. So that's why we can't say, well, why don't we try to reduce the impact of replacing fire stations? Or why don't we try to reduce the impact of uh, a new fleet maintenance garage? Because those are, those are going to cost property taxpayers a lot. They are. And they're essential core services of government. And they don't meet that regional significance test. So the statutory language that, uh, that allows the state legislature to say, yes, we think that you should be able to have this tool, is that we have to be serving a community beyond our own borders. Uh, so if the legislature does uh, uh, decide that these projects are, are worthy of a local option sales tax, they would go in front of the Bloomington voters. That would probably happen uh, in November of this year. And each, and each of those projects would stand alone. So voters would have the ability to say yes to all of them, no to all of them, or yes to some and no to others. What happens if the revenue is raised uh, from the sales tax or higher or lower? Um, if, the re if the revenues come in more than expected, uh, then the uh, fact is that we would pay off the, the debt sooner than what was scheduled. And the way that the local sales tax works is that at the time that it is no longer needed, it turns off. Or you have 20 years to collect the revenue, and then it turns off. Either way, it turns off, right? There isn't, there isn't a way for us to go back over there and say, you know, we'd really like to keep this thing going for a while. It doesn't work that way. We would have to go get all new statutory authorization, and we would have to have different projects then that the community would have to once again approve through a referendum. Now, if the revenues are lower than expected, um, we would uh, need to identify additional um, revenue sources uh, to make up the, uh, the difference there. Uh, one thing that's really important to note in this regard is that uh, other than the um, pandemic uh, of a couple years ago, th the sales tax revenue has been remarkably stable. And, it, you know, edging up, not edging down. And the other, the other thing I want to point out is that the University of Minnesota Extension Service in its own report indicates that their assumptions are conservative. Okay? So we're, we're uh, reasonably comfortable with the idea that uh, – the, the revenue is going to be stable and it's going to be as it's um, projected in the report. And the other, the other thing there, that last note, the city will carefully approach these projects. Um, <laughs> here's, here, here's the best assurance that I can give to the community about uh, our stewardship of these projects and the public dollars. We're one of only 40 cities in the country that has a triple, triple A bond rating, okay? Uh, that means that the, the three large rating agencies in this country have each given the highest possible bond rating to the city of Bloomington, and you earn that bond rating because of excellent financial management. You don't earn a bond rating like that by being cavalier with how you approach um, financial decisions, and I would say that we are using that very same philosophy in how we approach these projects as well. talked about the expiration, 20-year uh, sunset. That's uh, non-negotiable, and it would sunset earlier if the revenues are more than what they are projected to be on an annual basis, and we would satisfy the debt service earlier. How did the university verify their study? So um, it's, a, it's a data analysis. It's a study. It can get to be quite complex. 
Um, they, we've had two of these studies done already. So the first was based on 2016 sales tax. The most recent one was based on the 17, 18, and 19 sales tax. Uh, and then they do an analysis to look at the non-resident spending by category. And then they looked at the change from that first study in 2016 to the subsequent study to see how the categories changed. And then they um, further updated their assumptions on non-resident spending. And they are, um, they are very confident in saying that 75% of taxable sales are coming from people outside of the city of Bloomington. Uh, and uh, we'll ask them to do that again when we have that same um, study updated uh, to see if that analysis continues to be accurate. You know, the, the last point that I want to make, I referenced it uh, in the beginning of my comments, is, you know, the shift that we have seen in um, how people transact their business. Uh, an important uh, change in tax law came about in South Dakota versus Wayfair, Supreme Court decision from 2018, I believe, uh, in which the Supreme Court said that uh, they actually overturned uh, 40, 40, 50 years of precedence in saying that um, states could collect sales tax on internet generated activity, economic activity. That means that a a store does not have to have a physical presence in the state of Minnesota or in Bloomington in order for us to collect sales tax from it. Uh, most of the states in the country, uh, in fact, I think all that have a sales tax, have now made the transition to collecting sales tax on uh, Internet sales. Uh, so there, there isn't a way for people to avoid <laughs> paying sales tax because they're going online. Uh, and in fact, the way that uh, that helps, frankly, is that all of the all of the sales that are generated, you know, you have to put in your address and your credit card, and your credit card has a zip code that's associated with it. the The nexus of the transaction is where it occurs, and so based on how that is um, how that is administered, is that the transaction is considered to be occurring where the uh, consumer is, right? And so if the product is delivered to a 55425 zip code, then the transaction is deemed to have occurred in that place. And so the sales tax would be collected from it. Uh, interestingly, if somebody were to uh, live in St. Cloud and they want to buy something at Ikea and they go online and they want to pick it up instead of having that product delivered to them. So they come here and they pick it up here. That transaction occurs in Bloomington. And so we still get credit for that sales tax. So the, the whole point of this is that the, the way that people have changed their consumer behavior and how they are making purchases uh, more online than they have before uh, should not uh, negatively affect at all the sales tax that's being generated. In fact, it probably enhances it because uh, often those purchases would be made in some place other than Bloomington, and now we're getting credit for that activity occurring here. So I'll stop there, Mr. Mayor, see if Council has any questions, but more than anything, we want to just continue to communicate as clearly as we can with residents about why we're doing this, what it is, and what the process is. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. That's very helpful. And uh, to go over that once again and continue to explain it as often as, as we can to help people fully understand what we're talking about here and, and how this would all work. Council, any questions or discussion on this? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. Um, just a uh, sort of um, background question. I'm just to sort of clarify, I think, for folks watching at home, in, in terms of paying for these, uh, these facilities, I mean, our, our, our options basically are property taxes, local option sales tax, or maybe if we get lucky, some state bonding dollars. Yes. That's pretty much it, right? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Coulter, that is correct. Thank you. And, and I think that's, that's a point that needs to be made a little bit more clearly, I think, sometimes, is that we just don't have a lot of options in terms of how we, how we pay for these things. Um, because I mean, and you know, the, the other reality of course, is that if, 
if it were to fall entirely to property taxes, 100% of the burden would fall on Bloomington residents. Is that correct? That is correct, uh, council member. I guess I should it say would, uh, yep. Bloomington residents and businesses as well. Of it, it would, and to the extent that we have user fees that are associated with those facilities. So, for example, you know, we, we charge for ice time at, at Bloomington Ice Gardens. In order to service the debt uh, for a project of that magnitude, in the marketplace it is not feasible to increase the um, hourly ice rates to an amount that would be necessary to service that debt. If you wanted to say, we're going to do a project like that and we're not going to have Bloomington property taxpayers responsible for it, um, it, it the cost of ICE rental would, would be far more than the market could sustain. And so we'd actually lose ICE time because groups just wouldn't pay that amount. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an important point. Um, and then just sort of on the, on the technical side, um, you know, you mentioned if, if, you know, what happens if the revenue is higher or lower than, than projected, that, for lack of a better term, enforcement, that's done by the State Department of Revenue, That's correct? correct. Okay, as opposed to, like, the state auditor or, or yep. someone else like that. Um, so it's not handled by a, a politician but by sort of career civil servants at, at the Department of Revenue. Um, and then the last comment I would just make is, um, given the nature of a of – the legislative session this year, um, I mean, we're we're already coming up on deadlines here. I actually looked at my phone and um, the third committee deadline, which is the date by which uh, tax and finance bills have to be referred to the tax and finance committees in, in the House and Senate, is a month from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, I mean, we are, we are coming up on things fast. So I think um, it would certainly benefit us on the council and the broader community to, to have just really as frequent as update of as possible of updates on on these efforts. Yes. And and Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Coulter, uh, I I appreciate what the legislature, at least the House Tax Committee, is trying to do is process all of these requests at the same time. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that that we've that we've heard them say is that um, you know with so many of these requests, it isn't maybe as much about each of the requests as it is just the tax policy in general. And so they've been, over the course of the last couple of years, allowing uh, local option sales tax, un unless it just really is clearly not a regional project, they've, they've mostly been allowing these. And so I think the legislature is, is trying to reckon with whether there should even be a legislative step in here or if they simply give the authority to local governments um, to ask voters to approve it. Um, I don't think that will get resolved this year, but that is part of the conversation. Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, Manager, thank you for uh, kind of going over that and kind of uh, reviewing it. Uh, just a, uh, just a, well, three questions, basically. Uh, when we look at the projects that are there, we have got uh, four different, uh, or at least four projects uh, that are gonna be uh, put before the legislature and before the folks. And I, I wanted you to kind of just, again, just talk a little bit about how we got to those uh, specific ones. Um, and so, because some folks, when, I, when I'm knocking on doors you know, a couple of years ago, well, gosh, you're spending all this money on these things. What if we just don't do these things anymore? What's the impact? I know these may be uh, regionally um, significant, but uh, maybe we were just doing too many of these things and we could let some other community handle this stuff. That would be a way for us to save more money for our, our residents. And so I just want you to talk a little bit about how we got to picking these items here and uh, you know, how we got there. Mr. Brugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lohman, uh, the process for selecting them is based on a, a couple of things. One, uh, uh, frankly, it's the cost of the project and the, the impact to property taxpayers and trying to find uh, alternative ways to um, get some of these very expensive projects financed. Uh, and, you know, I think it is important to say that with, with the, the projects that we have here, um, you know, some of them are at a point where we don't have a choice. Bloomington Ice Garden is a good example, right? The... The refrigerant has to be replaced. The roof has to be replaced. And so, um, you know, unless the, the city wants to take a position that 
rather than reinvest that we would just um, no longer have those services, uh, then this is this is the option we're talking about is figuring out how to finance the reinvestment or the replacement of the facilities. So, uh, the, you know, the, the identification of projects that meet the statutory rules, and that's, again, that regional significance. And I understand there have been questions about some other projects that may uh, meet the uh, statutory rules. Uh, one, of the, one of the criteria is that it could be um, a continuous trail, uh, so there's been a question about whether we should um, pursue a, uh, a trail such as the Minnesota River Valley uh, Trail. That's, that's a project that has been uh, at the purview of the, of the state, and uh, we thought it was best that it stay uh, the responsibility of the state rather than having local taxpayers suddenly um, uh, take on an obligation for a, a state-funded project. Uh, that didn't seem to be a, a wise approach. And uh, none of the other opportunities that we have heard come forward have either been in the CIP for the number of years uh, that we have identified or have risen to that level of um, criticality within the community. So those are sort of the, the criteria by which we evaluated these. Does that answer the question, Council Member? Thank you, uh, Manager and Mayor. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, you're talking about CIP. We've got uh, well-developed projects that we've got some history with. Um, these are the ones we understand, um, and it's much easier for us to try to explain these and then the other items that you mentioned as well. And so I do appreciate that. Um, and so then just jumping into my last one, you had a slide in there. And I appreciate that slide because I think folks need to see the impact uh, that uh, if we were to not do this, the impact we would go through uh, once we get to the significance of, of uh, that we're going to uh, end up doing these items. And uh, that, that can be a quibble that could be talked about. Uh, we're talking about uh, $211, you know, on annual, um, you know, whereas we were able to bring that number down to 72 um, uh, uh, for the uh, the taxpayer, which is a $139 uh, uh, dollar, uh, uh, savings uh, for the taxpayer. And I just think that's a significant number that we need to continue to, uh, um, you know, have folks understand in terms of that impact that uh, that they will uh, experience. So I don't know if that's really a question, but more of, of a comment and wanting to wanting to highlight that. And and so and the reason why I bring these things forward is really kind of getting to my last question is that we've got a number of folks who are you know paycheck to paycheck. You know, we've talked about over the various times, and and, and uh, uh, certainly folks folks are viewing and go back and look at that. We talked about the regressiveness. Uh, of uh, sales taxes and how uh, even property taxes have changed uh, over time. And I appreciate that history. And so uh, really what I, I'm looking for is, you know, and maybe it's not in this presentation, but coming forward, but unique ways in which that we can kind of deal with that. We've got some folks who, who don't drive um, and who are going to be, they're, they're going to have to pay these taxes uh, uh, while they're here. They can't just jump across the border and uh, if they want to avoid uh, paying some of these taxes. And so they're just looking for any ways that other cities have been able to or other entities uh, to, to try to save these folks uh, um, um, a little bit on this uh, on this particular uh, the aggressiveness of this tax. And that we're thinking about that, you know, because uh, it is difficult and uh, things are rising. Inflation is uh, on the rise. And uh, we want to be mindful of that as we uh, as we move forward. Not necessarily looking for a response today, but uh, as we continue to do reporting, uh, the staff can kind of kind of take that seriously and get back to us on those. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, uh, agree with you. That's a, that's a, a hard one for us to uh, identify. You know what is the what is the household impact, uh, especially based on uh, you know household income. Uh, I think it, it's important to note again that essentials for a household income: food, clothing, uh, baby products, feminine products. All of those items that are untaxed, they're tax exempt, will continue to be tax exempt. And so, for the for the essentials for most households, there isn't a change in the uh, taxing policy. Councilmember Delvisandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, so uh, I'm at the risk of playing devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Was there some analysis done? by city staff about what would happen if we didn't 
get these things approved. So because even if we do get them approved at the legislature, what if the voters vote them all down? Like what um, – uh, and I, you know, because the, the option is to, to your point earlier, and I think you know maybe this is where Councilmember Lohman was going. The option is to just close the big, for example. That's one option we would look at. Um, you know, what what do we know? Like, have we gamed theory, if you will, or done some analysis on what the impact of not having these services in our communities in the future might look like? For for example, you know, does does Edina's you know, rank absorb the majority of those, um, you know, those uh, programs that we currently have at the big and therefore, you know, the region doesn't necessarily see an impact. Like, how do we how do we help people understand, you know, what the what the downside would be? Probably not in real dollars in the sense of like, yes, there's revenue to be lost, but also in like our, you know, how the regional impact might look. I'm just curious if we've tried to d to do any analysis on that. So we have an understanding of, you know, that might be our reality, you know, come the end of November. Uh, and if we don't want to put this into our property tax levy, um, we may be faced with some of those decisions. I'm just curious what you think about that. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, we have not game theoried that about what happens if we shutter any of these facilities and stop delivering services from them. Um, the work that we have done previously was uh, trying to estimate uh, – how we would manage the impact of property tax increases over time and try to reduce the impact somehow. And in that approach, what it means is having to phase these projects out over a much greater period of time uh, to try and mitigate the impact. Uh, so I think it's a much harder conversation to have to say that, you know, if, if we uh, are not successful here, uh, then we're not going to consider the property tax approach, and so we're going to look at that discontinuation of service. Um, we have not been tasked with modeling that, and we have not done that. Okay. I appreciate that, and I'm an optimistic person too. So I don't. I, I appreciate you not wanting to go there until we have to. Absolutely, but I, you know, it, I think it's, um, um, you know, in the back of lots of people's minds, especially since you know these, um, each of these things have their own value to different people, right? right? So there are people who love coming here for the arts, but don't play golf. And there's people who have kids in hockey, but, you know, don't come to the arts stuff. And like, there, you know, and there's people who don't use our public health services because they're able to afford private health insurance, for example. So we're, we're going to have that. And it's going to take a community a conversation, I think, about like how all these things lift all of the community up, even if you don't personally benefit from it. Right. And, and so it's going to be an interesting conversation. And I think it'd be worth us having at least some sense for the downside if we could get one. And, you know, don't um, the, the, the other thing I think that will be interesting and maybe this will happen for us in the over the summertime when we get the data. It is my opinion that, uh, to your point, um, we're actually going to see larger revenue because we, we're not necessarily including online sales changes in this data. But I, I think we also might see a shift to um, to more of our Bloomington residents bearing a portion of this burden just simply because Maybe. they they ship to their house, right, right. for example, right? <clears throat> and to your point, that's where the address is. So I think that will be really interesting. Our ro total revenue may be a, a much greater number than we're projecting here, but we also might see that that shift in the, the number. So I would um, maybe ask the folks at the extension office if they can break out the online versus retail sales, if they know how to, if they can do that with the data. So we understand that shift um, and whether that shift is something that happened at the, uh, because of the pandemic, for example, and it, it shifts back the other direction as we look at this data over time, or if that becomes our new constant. Um, I still think that most people, even if you did the math and it was $106 versus $2,211, i.e. 50% was being born by Bloomington residents, that's still a pretty good deal, right? Um, so, but I think, you know, we, we might want to take a look and, and, and understand how that number is going to shift. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, and those were both good points. And I think your, your first point in particular, the discussion of, well, what if? And I think that's an important discussion to have. And uh, there are many ways to look at it in terms of um, what we have been talking about about community amenities, what we've been talking about for centers of community. What if, 
what it takes to attract young families to our community, all those different things, what it takes to provide services uh, to our to our senior population and to our you know our our historically underrepresented populations. All of those conversations we've had, uh, I think, tie into many of the things that we're talking about here. And so then it becomes the question: Yes, if we if if the if none are approved, well then what? What what does it mean? And not just for not just for the, the the squirt hockey program in the city of Bloomington. What does it mean for Bloomington in general? What does it mean for Bloomington as a community? And I think it's uh, that that would be an interesting conversation to have. I think it'd be a sobering conversation to have, a very sobering conversation. Additional questions, Council? Mr. Mayor and Council members, we will keep you informed as the process roll, uh, plays out at the legislature. As Mr. Verbrugge said, uh, Wednesday, we are in front of the tax committee. And um, so at our next council meeting, we'll report back as to how that went. I'm hopeful that it's going to go well. <laughs> I can't, um, we, we've, we have had uh, some preliminary meetings with legislators, and it's been well received. I think they understand uh, what we're trying to accomplish. They have, uh, they've had similar questions. So we kind of, I think, expect, can, can know what to expect from the, the larger groups. And so, um, but uh, after our meeting on Wednesday, I'm sure it'll be included in one weekly, just a general kind of thing. And then we can discuss it again at our next council meeting on the 21st. The 21st. Yes. So, yeah. You certainly may ask one more question, Council. Apologies, Mr. Mayor. I just thought of something as you said what you said. I, I wanted to know, um, so we got here in, in part because for whatever reason, and I make no judgment about it, those buildings that are 50 years old didn't have a maintenance plan of a sort that would allow them to not become in the state of disrepair that they are today, right? I'm choosing my words really carefully here. But you, you know, I don't know those reasons. I didn't live here 50 years ago, obviously. And, you know, and so I, I want to be sensitive to that and say um, these dollars get us new buildings, which is great, but we have to do something different going forward unless we find ourselves in this position for Bloomington 50 years hence, right? And I'm just curious if we know what that looks like or if we're thinking about that and if we can talk about that as whether that's before or after these things get approved by our voters, um, you know, to just understand what that might look like too. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Councilman D'Alessandro, that's a really good point. And I would, I would sort of uh, point to Civic Plaza as um, example A of sort of that more uh, long-term historic uh, forethought of how to design a building for permanence. And, uh, you know, some of the buildings that we're talking about, uh, you know, Creekside was not developed as a community center. It was an elementary school, right? The public health building was uh, built a long time ago with not a lot of thought about what is, you know, what the growth of the community, how is that going to affect the services that we deliver? We, we spend time having those conversations when we're doing these capital projects now. The design of the fire stations is example B, is we're, we're being thoughtful about um, how the staffing model for our fire department might change and what that means for the space that we have to have in those buildings. Um, because I, I don't think it should be acceptable to residents that we're only designing buildings to get us through the next 30 or 40 years, right? I mean, um, I I was really glad when Target Field got built, but you know the, the dome was only 28 years old at the time, right? That it was approved or something along those lines. Um, we should be building public buildings for a much longer life. And uh, you know, 50 to 60 years is a good run for these buildings, uh, but you, you go all over the, well, Go to the eastern part of the country more than anywhere else or or go to other countries and see uh, buildings that are built to stand the test of time for hundreds of years, right? And that's frankly how we should be approaching this is building um, structures that will be um, permanent parts of our community for a long, long time. Council, anything else? Very good. Thank you for the update, Mr. Verbrugge. Yep. Greatly appreciate it. Our final item tonight is item 8.3, our City Council Policy and Issue Update. 
Mr. Verbrugge. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, one item I just want to provide a little bit of forecasting for is that uh, on the March 21st agenda, we'll, we'll uh, be bringing forward some uh, recommendations uh, regarding our rules of procedure and specifically related to public comment. I know over the last couple of years, the Council has uh, wanted to find ways to make um, the public comment process more accessible to the community, uh, more conversational. Uh, you know, I think the process we've used over the last uh, number of years where we take in information and uh, report back at a subsequent meeting um, is good in that it allows us to do some additional research and make sure that we have the facts right when we're providing response. It, it, you know, I think sometimes it's maybe not as satisfying for people who come in to, to just feel like that maybe they're talking at us and they're not getting much back. And so uh, we're, we're gonna bring back some changes in terms of how we approach public comment uh, to really try and make it more of a conversational opportunity between residents and the council uh, to truly bring forward concerns to the, the council and, and the council can be able to maybe respond to them more in real time. So that's one thing to look forward to on the 21st. Council, anything to bring forward tonight? Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I appreciated you all letting me toss out uh, talking about sidewalk uh, plowing and everything last time, so I figured I'd, I'd throw one more maybe random idea out there. Um, especially as we're talking about kind of these long-term uh, mechanisms, mechanisms for revenue generation, I, I know something I'm, I'm hearing kind of more and more often from folks is the hardship qualifications for special assessments. I've heard it recently as we're going through and taking ash trees out across the city. Uh, we have very, very specific Venn diagram of who is qualified as having a hardship that's just not matching up with the reality of a lot of families I'm mm -hmm. talking to. Uh, so as we're, not not to say this is an emergency, we need to, to drop everything and talk about it, but as we're looking at the budgeting process over the course of this year, just to have a little more information about, uh, the document I found explaining our process was from 2004 and hasn't changed substantially mm -hmm. since. Are we in steps with surrounding cities? Uh, especially from an, an equity perspective, are we assisting the folks that most need that hand in the community now almost 20 years later? So I just wanted to, to raise that um, as an idea and, and see if folks would be interested in kind of working that into our conversations. I, yeah, I, I think it's worth a conversation, absolutely. If it, yeah, if it's a 17-year-old document, 18-year-old document, yeah, it's time to maybe update it a little bit and take a, a fresh, put a fresh set of eyes on it. That's what I would think. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you. And Councilmember Martin, I think that's great. I, I, I think um, hardship qualifications, um, you know, even even thinking about that in a in a bit of a, a, a uh, a new way, right? There's, we've heard a number of folks, whether they, you know, we're talking about their, um, their, uh, public work services, like their, their, uh, garbage collection or the new organics recycling or other things. There's a variety of ways where, you know, we, we may want to look at, um, how someone can qualify for, you know, reduced, you know, requirements, uh, whether that's, you know, um, paying less or for certain reasons for certain things or or having some kind of a of a of a uh, charge back on you know property tax or whatever um, you know I think there's cool creative ideas we can come up with and so I, I would even add on to that it, you know not just for the maybe those particular special assessments but if we've got um, other areas that we've talked about over the last couple of months where we could look at potentially you know helping folks out I think that would be really great so I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you. Um, so one question I have, um, and I, I always get to the end of the year and, and uh, regret that I didn't ask it. And since we're, 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 we're only three months in, but I know at the beginning of the year, we kind of laid out some ideas that each council uh, person uh, wanted to uh, uh, have us work on for this year. I'm wondering kind of where we're at with those uh, requests. I'm not looking for anything today, but uh, as we kind of, you know, if there's a mid-year re review, um, uh, I figured I, you know, we're almost to the quarter point here, uh, kind of where we're at with those requests that we kind of had at the beginning of the year um, from the city manager. Um, and if we're making good, uh, Good uh, progress on those those items that we've uh, uh, brought forward uh, to to have the the council review this year. That's a good suggestion, council member. I 
and to be honest, we've been so darn busy with everything else. I, I admit that our first meeting of the year when we talked about all these things, uh, sometimes they get lost. I'll uh, agree with you there. So, Mr. Yeah, B I just think that we always uh, then we we keep adding things on there, and so I want to make we got to be <laughs> we got to be careful with staff. Yes. You know, we were worried at the beginning that uh, we'd have a lot of items, and then we keep adding items as as we go. And so I think we got to be be fair to our uh, fair to our manager uh, uh, when we do that. So agreed, agreed. Council, anything else tonight? Seeing no more business coming forward, council, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn tonight. So moved, Council Member Logan. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. There no further council discussion. Mr. Brillert. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Loman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much for your input tonight, council, staff. Thank you very much. Everybody watching tonight, thank you. Everybody have a good evening. Good night. Night, folks.